Umpires are at home plate. We're going to give you the starting lineups for both ball clubs. First of all, for the Dodgers, leading off and playing shortstop will be Alfredo Griffin. Willie Randolph will hit second and play second base. Eddie Murray will be at first base. Mike Marshall hitting cleanup in right field. Jeff Hamilton hitting fifth. John Shelby will be in center field. Rick Dempsey gets the nod behind the plate. He is hitting seventh. Jose Gonzalez in left field. And on the mound, the Dodgers and Tommy Lasorda will go with John Wetland. Wetland is four and eight with a 3.80 earned run average. This is his 11th start and the first time that he has ever faced the San Francisco Giants. Giants coming in six and seven against the Dodgers trying to even up the series for the Giants their lineup Butler in center field leading off. Robbie Thompson will hit second and play second base. Will Clark will be at first. Kevin Mitchell the cleanup hitter in left field. Ernest Riles will play third base tonight. Matt Williams gets the nod at short. Terry Kennedy doing the catching hitting seventh. Pat Sheridan in right field hitting eighth. And for the Giants as we mentioned in the open it will be Bob Nepper. And Bob Nepper warming up with a smile on his face seven and twelve with an even five earned run average. Now with the Giants Nepper is three and two with a two eighty five ERA and also with the Giants this is his sixth start and his second against the Dodgers. Oh and three in nineteen eighty nine ten and twenty lifetime. And for Nepper his last start. He went six innings allowed eight hits five runs two walks he didn't strike anybody out he lost to the Padres by a score of five to three. Nepper just about ready to take the field as his teammates who play behind Bob Nepper start out ahead of him. Dodgers 72 79 fourth place 15 games behind the San Francisco Giants. Of course the Giants not concerned about where the Dodgers are in the standings more concerned about the Padres who are now four and a half back and the Houston Astros who right now are six games back of the Giants. Take a look at how the Giants will set up behind Bob Nepper Clark at first base. Robbie Thompson will be playing next to Will Clark at second. Matt Williams the shortstop over at third Ernest Riles. In left field, Kevin Mitchell. Center fielder, Brett Butler, into the game with a great play last night. In right field, Pat Sheridan. Behind the plate, Terry Kennedy. And that's the left hander, Bob Nepper. Giants won the ball game last night by a score of three to two. The hero, Mike Laga. Laga coming in as a pinch hitter. Pinch hitting four. Matt Williams in the fifth inning. The bases loaded two down. Laga hit a ball high off the right center field fence. Cleared the bases and the Giants came up with three runs in the fifth and won it as I mentioned three to two. Probably had more enjoyment as a broadcaster watching the reaction of Mike Laga after he hit this ball right here than I have on any other reaction from any player this year. A look at Laga steaming into second base. Cleared the bases. He's going to get on second and he's going to let everybody know that he is one happy guy. <laughs> I went in the clubhouse before the game today Dwayne and he got all over me because last night I said he looked like Rick Russell. <laughs> yeah he didn't forget huh. Yeah I told him I said Hirschheiser probably knows the difference but I didn't. <laughs> well after. He hit the double. He was pinch run for. Take a look at the umpires. Ripley at behind the plate. Tate at first. Froming at second. Demuth at third. After he came running off the field, took his helmet off, and he thought he was going to nearly throw that helmet into the stands. He was so <laughs> excited. Well, here to call the action for innings number one and two is Joe. Thank you, Dwayne. Alfredo Griffin will lead it off against Bob Nepper. He takes ball one. He had four base hits in last night's ball game. Real productive leadoff hitter last night. He was on base four out of five times. He had four singles and a strikeout. There's another base hit to center field. As Butler dies for it, he did keep it in front of him. And I didn't think Butler was going to even get that close to it. It looked like a routine single to center, but Butler got a good jump on it. 
Well, Alfredo Griffin didn't waste any time. As Joe said, Butler really cut down the distance between the ball and himself. Really thought that he'd play that ball on one hop in front of him. Right. He almost it bounced about four feet in front of him. He made a good stop to keep it from going by him for extra bases. Willie Randolph's a hitter. He had one base hit in the contest last night. Good hit and run man. He fakes a bunt and takes ball one. Steve Ripley looks down at first base, uh, first base umpire Terry Tatum, and he says he did not go. Alfredo Griffin, there's Bob Nepper. Good look at Bobby. There he goes. There's a base hit to right field, perfectly placed hit and run, ground ball. Moving around the third is Griffin. And going to first base with a single is Randolph. Well, you mentioned it, Joe. Outstanding hit and run, man. And Randolph hits a pitch that is way out of the strike zone, pokes it into right field. Robbie Thompson covering on the attempted steal. And with him covering second, that left second base open, and that's exactly where really Randolph hit the ball. I was surprised, surprised Joe. that Robbie Thompson would be covering because Nepper throws the ball that tails away from the right-handed hitter, and Willie Randolph's not a pull hitter anyway. It would be tough for him to pull the ball on Bob Nepper, so you don't give him the easy shot at going to right field, but obviously they thought the pitch was going to be someplace else. Well, that's usually the case where catcher will give location the pitcher won't throw it there. Well Eddie Mary hits one deep to left field back on the warning track is Mitchell he makes the catch tagging up at first and going halfway as Randolph coming in to score is Alfredo Griffin as a sacrifice fly by Eddie Murray and I thought he hit it a lot better than he did Dwayne at first I thought it might go out of here but it just got to the warning track. Now big league sacrifice fly right here. See Eddie Murray with the extension of his arms. Puts Kevin Mitchell right at the warning track. Now Willie Randolph bluff like he might try to tag up and go to second. And Eddie's kind of saying a few things because that's a home run in Baltimore. <laughs> it's only 309 down the left field line. Here's the first pitch to Marshall breaking ball down and in for ball one. Marshall had one base hit in last night's ball game. In fact, all of the Dodgers starters, except for Oral Hershiser, had at least one base hit in the ball game last night. Here you see Marshall's numbers, and we made a note of it last night that he drove in 82 runs last year. He's only driven in 42 so far this season. He was injured last year as well, but a little more often this year than last year. Well, for Marshall, Joe, his 105th game this year. Usually you like to see a guy playing at least 140 by now. There's a pitch outside for a ball. But you can't play Joe if you're hurt. Well and that's true. You know that's not a knock on Marshall if you're injured. Well, you're certainly not going to go out there. Roger Craig giving the signs to Terry Kennedy of whether he wants a pitch out. In this situation or not. 2 0. Oh. Randolph's at first. The Dodgers have scored one here in the top of the first. They scored two in the top of the first last night. Nepper misses inside with the breaking ball. Now the count goes to 3 0 oh to Marshall. There you see Roger. And there you see the sign by Terry Kennedy. He's telling Nepper that Marshall will probably be swinging, so don't just lay the 3 0 oh pitch in there. And hope he's taking. You still have to make a pretty good pitch, he's saying. Strike on the outside corner, and that is a good pitch. Kept the ball away from Marshall. Well, I don't think Marshall too upset with this pitch being called a strike. It gives him an opportunity to come back and do what a cleanup hitter is supposed to do, and that's hit the ball hard somewhere and knock Willie Randolph in from first base. Yeah, I don't think he was looking for a walk. There you see the final score. The Padres three and the Reds one. It was ten innings. 
Padres scored two in the top of the tenth, and there you see the Braves and the Astros going into extra innings. The runner is going, and there's a pop up in the center field. Butler drifting over toward right center, and he makes the catch. And Randolph returns to first base. Two down. Jeff Hamilton will be the hitter. The one thing you don't want to do if you're Bob Nepper is get behind too often three and one to Mike Marshall or Eddie Murray because they can really hurt you. Although Marshall only has 11 home runs, but we've mentioned he has missed a lot of ball games so far this season. Eddie Murray has 19 home runs. And he also leads the Dodgers in RBIs with 86 now. Now this man right here, Jeff Hamilton, very quietly put together a pretty good year. He's done very well. There's a pitch out, nothing's on. He's done a lot more than the Dodgers expected of him. He is second to Eddie Murray in games played. Murray with 151, Hamilton with 142. So what you look at when you see the number of games that these players play, who are the guys that you can count on that stay healthy? And Hamilton has certainly been one of those guys. Pop up on the infield. Will Clark comes in. He makes the call and the catch. And that'll do it for the Dodgers here in the first. But they do come up with one run. They get a couple of base hits. They leave a runner. And as we go to the bottom of the first inning, it's the Dodgers one and the Giants coming to back. And we'll be right back after these messages. Dodgers with a one to nothing lead after one half inning to play Giants coming to bat. Eddie Murray will play first base for the L.A. Dodgers over at second will be Willie Randolph. Shortstop Alfredo Griffin. Jeff Hamilton at third. In left field it will be Jose Gonzalez. John Shelby in center field. The right fielder Mike Marshall. Doing the catching tonight, Rick Dempsey, Mike Sosha caught last night. And on the mound, John Wetland, 23 years old. Wetland's a rookie, 6'2, 195 pounds. He has lost his last five starts, and in his last three starts, he is 0 2 with a 10.50 earned run average. So, John Wetland. In those last three starts certainly has had his problems. He did not get out of the second inning in his last start. This is Brett Butler's final catch of the ball game last night. And you can see he's been making a lot of dives out there in center field lately. And on the positive side he's hitting 283 four home runs and 33 runs batted in. He takes a strike on the outside corner. Brett had two base hits in last night's ball game and a base on ball, so he was on base three times. Rick Dempsey goes out to talk to Wetland. Talked about that last start as you see Dempsey smiling a little bit at Wetland, probably crossed Dempsey up. His last word was relax. In that last start, Wetland went an inning and two thirds, five hits, six runs. One walk and three strikeouts. One ball, one strike to Brett. Ball two, low and in. Dempsey has not caught many of the games that we have broadcast, Dwayne. I wonder if he's still a breaking ball catcher or he's American League catcher, I would say. There's a fastball popped up on the infield. Hamilton is calling. And he makes the catch. So Butler is retired. I think that's one of the things that Wetland may have going for him. He missed with a couple of pitches pretty badly, and then he threw a high fastball, and Brett went after it. Well, it is a high fastball, and Butler gets underneath it, and that's usually what will happen when you approach a high fastball. Rarely will you hit on top of the ball. Yeah, one of the things I've always wondered about, I think small guys, not, you know, the big strong guys have trouble making contact with that pitch, but the small guys pop it up most of the time anyway, so it's tough pitch. Robbie swings and pops one up in the shallow left field. 
Gonzalez is there and he makes the catch. And there are two down. Yeah, I've always felt that you had to be pretty strong to hit the high pitch, but most of your big strong guys cannot handle the high pitch. So basically what it says is the high pitch is tough on everyone. Will Clark is the hitter. Will's hitting 336. Coming into tonight's ball game. Kind of defeats the old theory of keep the ball down, doesn't it? Right. I think uh, <laughs> I think one of the reasons you that was always the thought. There's a base hit to left field by Clark as he reaches out and lines one between third and short. Now well, pretty good piece of hitting by Clark. Fastball down. Just goes the other way with it. And I think Will Clark probably pretty pleased getting a base hit in his first at bat. Sometimes that will relax a flare and you can go on to have a pretty good day. Yeah, especially Will was 0 for 3 in last night's ball game, but he came into the tonight trailing Tony Gwynn by one point. We don't know what Tony Gwynn did in Cincinnati. But Will starts his night off in grand fashion with a base hit to left. Kevin takes one in the dirt and it bounces away from Dempsey and going down to second is Will Clark. And on wild pitch by John Wetland. Mitchell had one base hit in last night's ball game. Well, Dempsey tries to keep it in front of him and has slid over to his right. That wasn't even a 60 foot curveball. That's about 58 feet. Try to get your body in front of it and then hope that you get a good bounce and ricochet. So the Giants have the tying run at second base with two down. Mitchell takes a breaking ball for a strike. I would say that's an American League call but it's happening every place now I see more and more pitchers when they're behind in the count going to this breaking ball or change up something off speed now well, especially to guys like Mitchell right two and one high fastball Mitchell cannot check on he tries to check his swing but he went too far and it's two balls and two strikes all right now for Kevin Mitchell and all the Giants in the starting lineup first opportunity they've had to see John Wetland and it's a process of just trying to feel him out see what he's got. How good is that fastball. 2 2 pitch breaking ball again about 58 feet and this time it is blocked by Dempsey. You know Joe you and I have talked about it before you can. You can hear it from other players who have faced wetland. Perhaps in the minor leagues or you can see a scouting report. And it can be helpful but. The biggest help is getting in there seeing what kind of fastball it really is. Is it straight. Does it move a little. Does it. Uh, jump on top of you. Does he tail a little bit. And that's what the Giants hitters are looking for in their first at bat. I think right here if I'm Mitchell I look for a fastball even though he has a breaking ball. Because he can't get it over. And he doesn't there. So it's ball four. I think in that situation where he's bounced two curve balls. It's hard for me not to look for anything but a fastball. If he throws a curveball, he's probably going to throw it in the dirt or miss with it anyway. And so he draws a base on ball, and that brings up Ernest Riles, who's playing tonight at third base. Matt Williams has moved over to short, and Jose Uribe has been given a night off. Two down. Ball one outside. Wetland doesn't seem to be. Missing that much with his fastball, but the breaking ball, he's bounced a couple and he's thrown one strike out of about six attempts. So I think that's where I block out the breaking ball in my mind and sit on that one right there. The fastball, that's a good fastball. Right in under the hands of Riles. Take a look at Wetland's motion. Comes at you with that front leg. Pretty nice easy fluid motion. And good spot for that one. One and one. Fastball fouled off to the left side and out of play. And it's one and two. 
Well, Wetland was selected by the Dodgers in the January draft of 85. And then the Tigers liked him so much that they drafted him off of the Dodgers roster in December of 87 in the Major League Draft. Dodgers reacquired him in, on March 29th of 1988. Low and it almost gets away from Dempsey. So Dempsey's getting a work out here in the bottom of the first inning. But now Dempsey's had a workout already. You can see how that breaking ball will bite back towards the catcher. So far the only thing you have to do as a giant is look for the fastball and don't chase the curveball because he has not been able to get it over the plate. Two balls two strikes. High fastball and Riles swings and fouls it back. That one's tough to hit. <laughs> I'm sure that Riles doing exactly what you're talking about. Sitting on that fastball getting it and you have to be sitting on it to foul that ball off. I agree because if you're not looking dead red right there and you can't get the bat back up that high. The reason the high fastball is tough to hit because all hitters drop their hands as they start to the plate. Some hitters can get them back up in time but most of the time you can't on the good high fastball. Inside and it's full at three and two. Matt Williams is on deck. Well, if you're a fastball hitter, Joe, you got to be licking your chops. Yeah. And there's a fastball hitter right there, Matt Williams, who's on deck. Riles a good fastball hitter, but not normally a high fastball hitter. Bob Brindley and Roger Craig. Three balls, two strike. Fastball swung on and fouled at home plate. Got a piece of Riles. And again, Wetland has to go at the fastball because he doesn't have control of his breaking ball as of yet. Well, Wetland, born in San Mateo, graduated from Cardinal Newman High School in Santa Rosa, California. His dad, or his dad, Ed, well known pianist in San Francisco. Also a former player in the Cubs organization. So pitching runs in the family. Here's the three two pitch high fastball chopped foul at home plate again. There you see Will Clark as he returns to second base and Mitchell back to first are getting their wind sprints in. Now the only thing that. I watch Clark running back and forth and even though it's just a. A minor detail. Shortstops hate this because you see the second bit or that man on second taking its lead. They dig up their position. Yeah. And you start running back and forth and you leave some divots out there at that shortstop position. Three two pitch ground to the first base. Eddie Murray will take the play unassisted. And that'll do it for the Giants here. They come up with one base hit. They leave a couple of runners. And after one full inning, it's the Dodgers one and the Giants nothing. There you see the score as we go to the second inning, one to nothing Dodgers. This copyrighted telecast is presented by the authority of the San Francisco Giants and is intended solely for the private, non-commercial use of our audience. Any publication, reproductions, retransmission, or the use of the picture, descriptions, and account of this game without the express written consent of the San Francisco Giants is prohibited. And as we go to the second inning, Bob Nepper starts his second inning of work. And he will face John Shelby, Rick Dempsey, and Jose Gonzalez. As the Dodgers lead one to nothing, one run on two hits for the Dodgers. Will Clark has the only base hit for the Giants. And Shelby, a switch hitter, will turn around and start his evening on the right side. He takes a strike on the outside corner. Shelby has really struggled this year. His batting average is 181. Well below the Mendoza line. And he has one home run and 11 runs batted in. He had over 20 home runs a couple of years ago with the Dodgers. Fastball hit up the gap in the left center field. That's extra bases. Kevin will cut it off, but Shelby goes into second base standing with a double. 
I think that right there shows you how good a play Candy Maldonado made last night to throw Eddie Murray out, which helped preserve the Giants' one run victory. You've got to throw the ball a long way and you have to throw it accurately. Well, in this play, Shelby just puts it right in the middle of Butler and Mitchell. Now, Mitchell comes up with it. Now, had he made a perfect throw, we may have seen some action at second base. Throw is offline, so Shelby easily in with a double. And you could see Joey Amalfitano as he came down to talk to Rick Dempsey. They want to decide what Dempsey's going to do, whether he's going to try to pull, hit the ball the other way, or whether he's going to bunt. And he's going to try to go the other way, it looks like, on the first pitch. Here's the play you're talking about, Joe. Last night, Eddie Murray trying to stretch a single into a double. And just a perfect throw by Candy. And if you get the guy at second base, you never know what might happen. He might score the tying run. At that time, the Giants were leading by a run. Breaking ball down and in, and it's ball two to Dempsey. You know, I think the ball that Shelby hit a lot like the ball that Murray hit last night. Perfect throw, and you may have a shot at getting him. Right. But you're asking an awful lot out of that outfielder to make a perfect throw every time. And that's why I felt last night Murray's play was a good play on his part. And today it's a good play on Shelby's part. That outfielder can't hit that bag from you know 200 feet very often. Three and zero to Dempsey. He takes a strike on the outside corner, and it's three and one. Jose Gonzalez is on deck. And you see Gonzalez. Dempsey will probably still take a shot toward right field if the pitch is out that way. Well, he takes ball four. And there are now runners at first and second with no one down. And there you see, well, Lasorda is talking to Gonzalez before he goes to the plate. Lasorda came out of the dugout and said something to the youngster. So now he knows what he's supposed to do and will not make any mistakes as far as the signs are concerned. Well, the question will Lasorda bunt Gonzalez, move those runners along, and then we got the pitcher spot coming up next. Really think that he is going to let Gonzalez swing away. I agree with you. I don't think you bunt guys over for the pitcher too often. And there you see McCammett as. He starts to throw in the Giants bullpen. Dodgers have runners at first and second. No one down. They lead one to nothing. We're in the second inning. Fastball grounded. Robbie was breaking the other way, and the ball goes in the right field for a base hit. Moving around to third is Dempsey. And the Dodgers lead by a score of two to nothing. I don't know if Robbie had a play on or what. He started towards second base. And the ball was hit just a little bit to his left, but he could not get back in time. Well, the reason he couldn't get back is when you start, you have to stop. And his momentum, you can see it just left him flat footed. And because of that, another RBI and the Dodgers lead two to nothing. It really looked on contact that it would be a double play ball. Right. But I, I don't know if he was breaking towards second. There you see is what Dwayne said. He's frozen right there on his feet, on his heels. Because he had started towards second base. Well, here's the pitcher, Wetland. He's squaring around to bunt, but I think it's not a squeeze. He's just bunting the runner over to second base and put him in the scoring position, and he does that. And it's a good sacrifice by Wetland. So now the Dodgers have runners at second and third with no one down. In that situation, there's no chance or no thought of Dempsey coming in from third. Absolutely not. Nepper will just wheel and throw to Robbie Thompson covery. And that's the first out of the inning. So now they have runners at second and third with one out. And the Giants are going to play the infield in. I'm sure Robbie will come all the way in. The rest of the infield is already in. And Alfredo Griffin is the hitter. He's single his first at bat, and he had four hits last night. So he has five for six in the series. There's a fastball up for ball one. 
the Giants are playing the infield in, but I would have to think that if a ball is hit back to the pitcher, they would not have to make a play at the plate. Any place else, the Dodgers may be sending Dempsey. There's a fly ball in the center field. It's going to be deep enough for Dempsey to tag up and score. And also, Gonzalez tags up and goes over to third. So Dempsey comes in to score on the sacrifice fly. And the Dodgers lead by a score of three to nothing. Yeah, they're just pecking away at the Giants right now. Obviously, it always helps to get the leadoff man on, and the Dodgers have done that in both the first and second innings, and both those guys have scored. And there you see Dempsey as he scored on he walked and was moved along on base hits and the sacrifice fly to score the run. Two down now. Gonzalez is at third. The Giants play the infield back at normal depth. Willie Randolph is a hitter. Randolph had a hit and run base hit his first at bat as he singled through the right side of the infield while Griffin was running. And that moved him around the third and he scored on the sacrifice fly. There's a liner right over the glove of Nepper in the center field. Coming in the score is Gonzalez. And the Dodgers take a four to nothing lead and out comes Roger Craig. And that may be all for Bob Nepper here in the second inning. Nepper has allowed four runs on five base hits and he did make the wave down so Randy McCammett will come in to pitch. So the Giants have fallen behind the Dodgers again tonight. They fell behind two to nothing in the first inning last night, came back to win three to two. Tonight they're behind four to nothing, and we're only in the top of the second inning. But McCammett will come in to do the pitching. Well, the one thing the Giants cannot afford to do, even though we've discussed it before, Dwayne, is to feel like maybe they can relax a little bit. Because before you know it, You'll be playing in L.A. and San Diego, and you'll get a look at you get a look at the three outfielders talking about hitting. At least Brett Butler is. Well, I tell you, if someone would have said that those Giants three outfielders are going to all get together now, which one is going to do the talking? And <laughs> pretty much guarantee that yeah. Butler is going to do the talking, and the other guys are going to do the listening. Mitchell doesn't talk a lot, and neither does Sheridan. So. There we go. Now there are the possibilities. If the Giants go two and nine, then the Padres to tie would have to go six and four. If the Giants go seven and four, the Padres would be eliminated. Six and five, the Padres would have to go ten and zero. Oh. So you can well, see. I, I think these are a little deceiving, though, Dwayne, because they have to play the Padres. See, and if the Padres are winning. That's also adding a loss to the Giants side, so it will not be. It's, I think that's a little inaccurate. It would be if they were not playing each other, that would probably be the way it would go. I think those are not exactly accurate in the fact that if they play each other, it's a two game swing, not just the one. Because it goes a loss in the Giants side and it also eliminates uh, and it adds one to San Diego side. So I think it's not quite as simple as that, meaning the Giants may not be able to go four and seven and win it. Because they will be playing the Padres. And they also have to play the Dodgers in L.A. And I think that is something that you don't look forward to if you're a Giants fan. Here's the first pitch to Murray, and he lines one in the right field for a base hit. Randolph goes to second and stops. The throw comes in behind him, but he's safe as he gets back in. And Eddie Murray has a base hit. And the Dodgers have hit the ball very hard tonight as contrast to last night they had a lot of hits in the first couple innings but they were choppers and infield hits and little bloopers. Now well, this ball is sinker away and Eddie Murray with those long arms just jerks it into right field and they've hit some balls hard tonight as I say contrasting that to last night's choppers and little you know soft line drives over the infield. Mike Marshall is the hitter. He takes a swing at a breaking ball and it's strike one. Marshall hit a fly ball to center field his first time up. Well, you hate to be down this early, but you have to remember the key word is early. Yeah, and you have the Giants still have eight chances to make up the four runs. 
And those chances being innings, not at bats. Right. So I guess the way you look at it, they have 24 outs left. There you see Trevor Wilson on the right. And that's Stu Tate on the left. Here's a pitch to Marshall, grounded to short stop. Matt Williams charges. He will have to go to first base, and he does. And he retires Marshall. But not before the Dodgers come up with three runs. They also get three base hits in the inning. And after two and a half, one and a half, it's the Dodgers four and the Giants nothing. Well, the Giants have a little bigger hill to climb tonight. They have a four run deficit as we start the second inning, but on the positive side, they don't have Oral Hirschheiser that they have to score the four off of. And as Dwayne mentioned, Wetland has not done too well in his last few outings, but you can't ever count on that. Matt Williams takes low for a ball, and I think. One of the things the Giants have to do with a guy like Wetland when you're down four runs is to be patient. Yeah, because a four to nothing lead can make this young man a better pitcher. Exactly. If he has any jitters, a lot of times you look at the scoreboard, you got a four run lead, and you can relax a little bit. But he is not able to control his off speed pitches or his breaking ball, so you just have to be patient. Don't swing at the fastball out of the strike zone, but make him give you one that you can handle. And forget about the breaking ball. I would forget about it because he's not able to throw it over the plate. Here's a two and one pitch. He threw it over the plate then. I would have still taken that. Well, you can see how the Dodgers obviously love this guy. He fits the mold of, of the types of pitchers that they look for. Young, good arm, good build, strong legs, and he throws hard. And they can teach him the other things. Well, see, that's what happens. You chase the breaking ball. Because he's not throwing it for a strike, you end up chasing one. And Matt goes down on strikes. Well, Matt's going through one of those spells that he went through prior to his trip to Phoenix. And pretty simple, and I'm sure Matt Williams realizes it. He's just chasing breaking balls that are out of the strike zone. Well, he was hitting the ones in the strike zone when he first came back, and he's proved to himself and to most other people that he could handle it. But if you don't get a strike, you're going to have problems with it. There's Terry Kennedy chasing a fastball, not catching up to it. You know, watch Wetland. He almost jumps at you when he releases the ball. He actually leaves his feet. Now, of course, he didn't do it that time. <laughs> <laughs> but it almost looks like he recoils after he throws the ball. One strike to Kennedy, one down. We're in the bottom of the second inning. Fastball foul down the left field line and out of play. And the Giants are trailing by a score of four to nothing. But I, th I think you see what happens though when you have a veteran catcher like Rick Dempsey. He goes to the fastball, tries to get him ahead so that maybe they will help him out by chasing the breaking ball. There's a smash to Eddie Murray off of the breaking ball, but Murray makes the put out unassisted. Kennedy hit it very hard, but right at Murray. My point of saying that he gets out in front, you will usually chase a breaking ball with two strikes. With no strikes, you don't chase a breaking ball too often. So the only, if you're not throwing strikes with the breaking ball, you try to get ahead with the fastball, and then it'll help you out by chasing the breaking ball occasionally. And you can see he started each hitter off with the fastball other than Matt Williams. Well he can especially afford to do that Joe like I said before when you're leading four to nothing. Right. Change up different pitch he has not thrown that. In the first inning but he comes back with a good change up. Change up again popped up as Sheridan just reached for it with one arm one hand and no one can get to it. So the counts no balls and two strikes. And here again as Dwayne mentioned when you get a four run lead you can start to relax. He, he didn't throw a change up in the first inning. Now he's using all of his pitches. There you see Dempsey giving chase. To the foul ball. Well in some cases Joe relaxing is not good but I think in a rookie's case it is pop up. 
on the infield side on right side of the infield I should say Willie Randolph waits for it. And that'll do it as the Giants go down one two three here in the second inning. And we've completed two full. It's the Dodgers four and the Giants nothing. And as we go to the third inning, we have a guest in our booth, and we also have Dwayne Kuyper to do the play-by-play. -play. Dwayne? Well, the guest, Joan Ryan, and McCammon facing Jeff Hamilton. Joan Ryan, columnist for the San Francisco Examiner. Welcome, Joan. Thanks, Dwayne. Certainly hasn't been the first time you've been here, but it always is enjoyable when you do decide uh, that you'd like to sit in with us. Bet you say that to all the girls. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Williams to Clark. Hamilton retired, one out. Joan, I just found out that you were married to a friend of mine, Barry Tompkins. I didn't know that's who you were married to. If I'd have known that, I wouldn't have given you such a hard time over the years because I would have known you're a pretty smart person. That's right. Now you know why I'm so happy. Yeah, I would have known you're a pretty smart person choosing somebody like Barry. I really, I didn't know that until I read this Let's little see, bio that behind. they gave us. Yeah. Here's John Shelby with one out. Shelby doubled and scored to lead off the second inning. McCammon on the mound replacing Bob Nepper. And Shelby tries to lay one down, and it's a strike, 0 1. Jones been covering a lot of different areas for the examiner football, baseball, basketball. And I'm sure that this is the time of the year when you get the opportunity to do a lot of columns on the different sports that certainly are going on in the Bay Area. Yeah, it's definitely this is the most fun time of the year, especially when we have two teams that are contending in an independent race and with the 49ers coming off a Super Bowl. Um, you know, there couldn't be a better time for a sports writer. What is your favorite sport to cover or should I do it two ways? What is your favorite sport? Baseball is definitely my favorite sport. All right, what is your favorite sport dealing with the players or the athletes? It's still baseball, but I think that's because uh, we're a little spoiled here in the Bay Area. We have two very good teams with good front offices and they're real easy to deal with. I don't know if you'd find the same answer if I lived in another city. Right. But um, you know, being a Bay Area sports writer, definitely baseball. Well, that's why I asked the question. Some of the places I've gone, I've heard different stories. Some mm -hmm. guys like baseball more, but they love covering the athletes for football or vice versa. Full count to John Shelby. And Shelby goes the other way and drives the ball between Riles and Matt Williams. Shelby now two for two, a double and a single. And the single comes with one out here in the third inning. It's hard to think a guy is at 170 coming into this series and he's hitting line drives every play. Well, especially Joe with the stroke. Yeah. Really is a good stroke. Anytime you see a player go the opposite way in a pitch that is high and outside. It looked like it was maybe even a changeup, Dwayne, something off speed, and he still went the other way with it. Here's Rick Dempsey, Shelby, the base runner. Shelby has has eight stolen bases on the year. He's been caught six times. Dempsey walked and scored in the second inning. That's the inning. The Dodgers put three runs on the scoreboard. Four nothing. Dodgers leading. Pitch misses to Dempsey. One ball and no strikes. So one of the columns that you wrote, Joan, a baseball column about the return of Bob Brenly. And it really was a magical moment when Brenly came in, started national TV, came up with a double. That's right. Yeah, I tell Bob that uh, whenever he does anything in a, in a game and I have an opportunity to write about him, <laughs> it's like getting a day off. You know, I just hand him my notebook and he fills it up. <laughs> He's wonderful. Certainly an easy guy to interview and very quotable. Absolutely. Shelby goes and Kennedy cannot get the ball out of his glove. Stolen base number nine for John Shelby. We had a shot of Bob earlier, Dwayne, and I wanted to mention at that time he was standing there with Roger Craig kind of surveying the field. I was just wondering, did you ask Bob about his aspirations of being a manager? I think he would make a good manager. I think so too. He, he's, he's mentioned though before, I don't know if uh, he's mentioned this to you, that, that he might be a little tired of the travel. After he's done I know playing. The feeling. Yeah, I know. <laughs> one and one to Dempsey. And that's high and tight. In my conversations with, with Bob Brenly, he basically has said he really has no interest whatsoever in staying in the game. Now that doesn't mean that three or four years after you're out right. of it, you don't get the taste back. 
trouble is, it's hard to get back once yeah, you leave. Yeah, you usually, usually get back when a friend becomes a manager, right, or becomes a part of a front office somewhere. I really have always felt that Brenly would be a great guy to be in the in the business that we're in, in the broadcasting part of it. He'd be trigger it. I mean, I could see him as another Tim McCarver. I think he has the same sort of sense of humor. He remembers every anecdote he's ever heard. He has mentioned, though, coaching on the high school level, that that would be something he'd be interested in. Well, travel certainly a lot less at that level. Yeah, the money's not as good, though. <laughs> Three balls and one strike. McCammon falling behind to Rick Dempsey. Jose Gonzalez is on deck. And Dempsey chops this one foul. Now it's a full count. Shelby continues to try to time McCammon at second base. Maybe he wants to run on the pitch, but he he's trying to time him. And he hasn't been able to do so as of yet because he starts and McCammon's not going. And then when he stops, McCammon delivers. So McCammon is doing a good job of varying his delivery to the plate. Three balls and two strikes. McCammon to Dempsey. And Dempsey draws a walk. Dodger base runners at first and second with one out, and that will bring up Jose Gonzalez. John, one of the things that I believe in, and I've talked to Dwayne about this on several occasions, is that a manager in the 90s has to be different than the managers in the past. I consider guys like Cito Gaston, um, Tony La Russa, I think, is a man for any time. But I think, meaning the, they're going to have younger managers that can deal with the players a little better, can understand the players and maybe have a little better relationship with the players other than say do this do that and whatever because the players of the 90s don't have to do that anymore because of their contract situations and all the money that they make and the guaranteed contracts and I think it takes a special manager to be able to be both disciplinarian friend and also say we're in this together type of manager and I think the young guys are the ones that are going to have to do that the Art Howes I should mention and Cito Gaston are two guys that come to mind for me. Do you think that it's going to take a different manager or the players going to have to adjust? You know, you see the Roger Craig's and the Sparky Anderson's and, you know, they're from the we different era, but they seem to relate to the players pretty well. Maybe it's more just a personality thing than a generation thing. Well, I personally, you know, just my opinion, I think it's a generation thing because the values or certain things that you're taught, like Roger Craig when he came into the game, even Sparky Anderson or myself, are really not obsolete but they're just not as prevalent today as they were before about the things you think about the team first and yourself second that's not always the case and I don't blame the players because there's so much money at stake now whereas in the past you know that was the only way to get a raise but I'm not sure that the manager should still stress all those values well Matt Williams keeps it on the infield that'll keep Shelby from scoring it'll be an infield hit and now the bases are loaded for John Wetland I think that's one of the things that's Gaston and how does well with the young players though he's able to stress it and they listen so to speak. Here's here's the swing by Gonzalez and it goes in the hole nice play by Matt Williams to save a run. If the ball goes through Shelby would have been able to score but as is the Dodgers have the bases loaded with one down. Now Wetland with a sacrifice bun and is only at bat that came in the second inning. And here on the pitch inside, he tries to hold up. Just to go back a little bit, Joe, talking about managers, you know, it really still all goes back to the acquiring of young players in the minor leagues and their development. You know, it's a lot easier for a manager to manage a player that has proper development in the minor leagues once he gets to the big leagues. Grounded, fair, and down the left field line. Shelby scores. Here comes Dempsey, and they're going to wave Gonzalez. He's going to score, and the pitcher, John Wetland, clears the bases with a stand up double. Dodgers now lead seven to nothing. Well, McCammon got a ball that Wetland can pull out over the plate, and he pulls it down into the corner. And by the time that Kevin Mitchell is able to get it back in, all three of the base runners have scored and the Dodgers now lead by a score of seven to nothing. We're well, good to look at this pitch. It's a little bit out over the plate. He pulls it inside the bag. Now by the time Kevin digs it out Gonzalez comes around from first base to score and also Kevin missed the cutoff man who was Matt Williams 
And they had no shot at Gonzalez because he missed the cutoff man. Now there you see Tate, the right hander, Wilson, the left hander. And Marty Demerit down in the Giants bullpen, subbing for Norm Sherry, who has a pinched nerve, letting Roger Craig know that both pitchers are ready. And with that, Roger Craig is going to come out and make the pitching change. He's also going to make a double switch, Dwayne, because he went to the umpire first. So someone else is coming out of the game, and it's the right fielder, Sheridan. And Jim Weaver is going to go in to replace Sheridan. Since Nepper, well, I'm sitting McCammett was scheduled to lead off the bottom of the third inning. So now Jim Weaver will lead it off. Now Roger taking his time, and it's going to be Stu Tate, right hander. This will be Tate's first appearance, I believe. And this is his major league debut. And if you've ever worn a major league uniform, you will never forget your major league debut, whether it be your first major league at bat or whether it be your first appearance in the big leagues as a pitcher, as it is for Stu Tate. Tate in conversation with Terry Kennedy going over the signs. Giants trailing seven to nothing. We are in the third inning. Take a look at Giants managers with four straight winning seasons. McGraw, Terry, DeRocher, Alvin Dark, Herman Franks, and the hum baby, Roger Craig. John, what do you like least about your job? <laughs> Let's go in the opposite direction here. Well, sometimes the travel. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm married, you know, I like to stay home a little bit more. Well, he's gone he's too. He's gone though. all the time too. I know. We pass in the red carpet room at the SFO, <laughs> basically. Um, I would say that, and, and coming up with ideas is very difficult for me. Um, I know that that's a strength of a lot of columnists, and it, and it ought to be, but uh, it's hard to come up with three ideas that fit into 25 inches, um, you know, every week. What is your column limited? Say, 200 words, 400. Yeah, How many? It, it is. It's about. It's about 25 inches of, of newspaper copy. How many which, words is that? Oh, I don't even know. Oh, you don't know? Okay. No, I don't write it like that. I write by inches. Oh, okay. <laughs> when I used to try to do a column, I was, you know, had words, mm -hmm. 200 words or whatever it was. I can't remember. But I did it by the word. I didn't have the inches. I didn't know how that worked. I wouldn't have known anyway. What would be the toughest type of story to write? Happy, sad? The sad story is because you can go one of two ways. You can not capture it and come off a little callous, or you can go too far the other way. A lot of boos here in the candlestick. Well, I'm trying to figure out if they're saying stew or boo, because there's no reason to boo right now. <laughs> well, it's about six runs too late. Stu Tate will be facing Alfredo Griffin. And I think it's because he's making his first major league appearance. So that's what it is. They were yelling Stew. Well, here's his first big league pitch. And he'll remember that. He threw a fastball right by Alfredo Griffin. And the folks right now trailing seven to nothing at Candles, they're gonna have some fun with Stu Tate. <laughs> and that's in the dirt. And I mean fun in a good way. Well, I'm sure that, that makes Stu feel good, especially. Coming in in the situation against the Dodgers. Stu, 40 years from now, say, you know, to his <laughs> grandkids, 50,000 people were in unison going, Stu. <laughs> basketball good down. Basketball. But it's a little low, but it's a good one. Two balls and one strike to Alfredo Griffin. John Wetland, the base runner at second base, one out. Dodgers scored one in the first inning, three in the second, and three here in the third. Seven nothing lead. And swinging and missing is gripping two balls, two strikes. Take a look at his motion, Joe. Well, it looks like he, the power pitcher, of power pitchers usually fall off to the first base side, and he does that in his delivery. And Griffin stays alive, fouls it back. He also has an interesting position on the mound. He stands to the extreme right corner, the third base side of the mound. And he falls off to the first base side, which says to me that he likes to get a little crossfire on the right handed hitters. You can see he's on the extreme right corner of the rubber. 
Here's the 2 2 to Griffin. And he did barely get a piece of it. Folks here at Candlestick thought he struck him out. And that's what they're waiting for. Well, Stu seems to be very calm on the mound. I have to give him credit for that. He doesn't seem overly excited about this appearance. And my first at bat, I was shaking all over. <laughs> Two balls, two strikes, and he got him. Tate strikes out Griffin for the second out. And he gets a standing ovation here at Candlestick Park. They were waiting for something to cheer about. <laughs> now for Stu Tate and his family, <laughs> nothing could make them happier. Well, it's a good tailing fastball. It tails away, but it has a lot of get up and go on it. And Griffin was a little late. Here's Willie Randolph. Randolph with a pair of hits and two at bats. And Tate loses this one in the dirt. And Wetland is rounding third, and he's going to hustle back as Kennedy chases it down. Wild pitch. Allowing Wetland to go to third. Well, you can see it's a breaking ball in the dirt. Kennedy tries to get over in front of it, but when the ball hit, it really spun back to his left. And it just got a piece of him instead of hitting him in the chest and it bounded away. One ball and no strikes to Willie Randolph. Randolph last night, one for five. And Randolph fouls it back. Count is even one and one. We mentioned it last night, Dwayne, about how the second basemen have done, meaning Willie Randolph, who came over from the Yankees, and Steve Sachs, who went to the Yankees. And both of them have had excellent seasons. Sachs has done a little more offensively. And I saw in the paper the other day that he may win a gold glove. They're touting him for that over in the American League. Willie Randolph drives it in the center field. Butler turns around. He's on his horse and he makes the catch. But the Dodgers come up with three runs here in the third inning and they lead seven to nothing. Tonight we have a two part feature on Giants first baseman Will Clark. In our first segment, Will shares with us some of his theories on hitting. Will Clark is one of the top hitters in baseball. His success at home plate begins with his mechanics. All hitters have certain basic fundamentals that they go through. And, uh, you know, it's where they start their hands or, or you know, at point of contact where, where, where the head of the bat is. And uh, all hitters have certain fundamentals that have to be the same. But everybody has their own different style in order, getting, in order to get to those Fundamentals. Basically, my swing is based on uh, balance, uh, bat speed, which is generated by the lower body, and uh, perfect contact. Because if you get the ball off the end of the bat or off the hands, it doesn't go anywhere. So uh, you have to be very consistent in, in, in how you swing because you don't want to change anything. You don't want anything to feel awkward because your main point of focus is on the pitcher. I'm not a big person physically. So uh, I have to generate some sort of power, some sort of way or another, and uh, do it strictly with legs and hips. Anyone who has watched Will Clark has noticed his game face, a fierce look of concentration as he steps into the box. The big thing that I'm thinking about is seeing the ball. My whole philosophy on hitting is seeing the ball. If, if I can see the ball out of the pitcher's hand, see what spin it's got on, see what rotation, and then see it all the way until the point of contact, uh, if I'm swinging it back good, you're in trouble. My whole concentration, you know, all the facial expressions and all that, uh, that's all out the window because all I'm doing is focusing in on the pitcher. There's Will Clark down in the Giants' dugout. That is part one of the two-part series we're going to do on Will Clark. Joe, you said something I've heard a lot of people talk about, getting your hips open and, and some of the things that, that all the great hitters try to do. But Will said something that I've never heard a player say, and that's perfect contact. I mean, obviously, guys want to make uh, the perfect contact, but rarely will you hear a player say, well, that's what I try to do. You figure guys just try to do that automatically. 
But here's a guy who concentrates on perfect contact. Well, I think it's a way of concentrating at the point where the bat meets the ball, and obviously that's what we all concentrate on. But like you say, he describes it a little different. I thought the interesting point for me is he said he used his lower part of his body and his hips for bat speed. And remember the other night we talked about the difference between he and Tony Gwynn. Tony Gwynn hits with the upper part of his body, and I think Will uses his entire body. He uses the lower part as well as his upper part. So I think that's why he hits home runs. Again, as compared to Tony Gwynn, does not hit a lot of home runs because he uses mostly just the upper part. And I think probably Will at this age understands quite a bit more about hitting than a normal guy at the same age. Weaver lines to Murray one out. So Jim Weaver hits the ball well. Comes up empty and that'll bring up the top of the order Brett Butler. We'll get another look at it. He hits it off the end of the bat but he does hit a line drive but right at first baseman Eddie Murray. Eddie doesn't even move there. It's right at him. Another thing about hitting Dwayne I think he understands that no matter where you start it's the position you get yourself in to hit the ball is what's important. A lot of guys spend a long time trying to measure their stances their strides etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But the only real thing that matters is where your bat is once you take your stride and how you react to the ball from that point on. Now this ended the inning in the third for the Giants. Butler went a long way as Willie Randolph drove him nearly to the warning track. 0 and 1 to Brett Butler and that's high and tight a ball and one strike. I suppose one of the. One of the nice things about covering and as Joan Ryan mentioned you've got. Two Bay Area teams both in first place. As you see the 1 1 to Butler. The cast of characters is obviously very different. You certainly wouldn't want to cover a boring team, and I'd have to say that neither the A's nor the Giants would be considered boring. No. As far as personalities. No, that's you know, under normal circumstances, I wouldn't think the networks would look forward to a Bay Area World Series because they miss the, the East Coast market. But I think in this case, because you do have uh, you know the quote unquote superstars on both teams, the Will Clark and Kevin Mitchell over here, and, and Jose Canseco and Ricky Henderson and. Um, you know even Mark McGuire to a certain extent over in the East Bay that that would probably get the viewers in because they're so well known beyond the context of the team. Butler showing but again watch. I think the difference between the two teams as I see it though the Oakland A's as an organization really tries to keep a certain image with their players and I guess all of them personify that image except Ken Seiko but they try to keep you know a certain image in the community whereas I think the Giants are a little more free spirited and the guys do what they want to do and, and, and let it go at that. I think the A's are a little more structured. Take a look at. How the A's and Giants Jays and Cubs how they play in their own ballpark. A's with the best percentage 49 and 25. Here's Robbie Thompson. I think that starts with the manager don't you I think that Tony sets the tone over there and well, that Roger sets the tone over here. Well I agree to a certain extent but it still goes back to the teams because the guys that hired the managers had an image of what they wanted mm -hmm. that manager to be or the image that they wanted that team to be. Um, Sandy Alderson uh, Roy Eisenhardt all these guys that were there before Tony. Double play got him retires the side for the Giants here in the third after three complete. It's the Dodgers seven Giants nothing. Well it's time for the Azuzu Stumper the first person to call in with the correct answer wins two free tickets to a Giants home game in 1990. The toll free number one eight hundred seven two two forty six hundred and tonight Stumper who was the last major leaguer to win a batting title and lead his league in RBIs in the same season. We'll be right back after these messages. Well we played three here at Candlestick and you can see the numbers they are not very pretty Dodgers with a run in the first three in the second three in the third and because of that the Giants have their third pitcher on the mound and his name is Stu Tate affectionately known as Stu Tate to the fans here at Candlestick folks here are not about to leave and we certainly do have some diehard fans in the Bay Area. 
Remember the years the Giants lost 100 games, you'd wonder why there was anybody at the ballpark, and believe it or not, the usual diehards showed up every day and every night. You know, you mentioned Dwayne, it is, has been a hard three innings for the Giants. Something seems to be bothering Eddie Murray out there in center field. Well, I guess maybe he wanted Bruce to move. Yeah, Bruce is deeper in center field than normal. So Bruce moved a step and a half. <laughs> you know, we're talking about the teams again. The reason I bring that up, Joan, is because I played for the Cincinnati Reds and they didn't want any mustaches, no long hair. Your stirrups and your socks had to be down low. And Sparky Anderson was the manager, so everyone thought that was Sparky's idea, but it really wasn't. It was the ownership of the team. Because if you look at Sparky now in Detroit, he doesn't have the same types of rules or whatever. So I, I think most of the time the image is really set by the owner or the top echelon in the organization. And they hire a manager that will, you know, take those things on through to the players. Murray pops out to Butler in center field. That's the first out here in the fourth inning. I happen to agree with you. I, I really think Tony La is a fantastic manager personally. And I've watched the way he's handled Canseco. I've watched the way he's handled the other players. And I think he just does a fantastic job. Mary chases a high fastball, and you see he's very upset. I mean, that's a high fastball, and he throws, <laughs> throws his bat into the ground. Here's Mike Marshall. And Marshall now steps out and they're complaining about something. Oh, uh, now the umpire says turn off the scoreboard. See the white on the Dodger on the Giants vision. That's the problem. Jumbotron, I'm sorry. You got Giants vision on the brain. But it's a white background, as you can see. The Dodger sign is in white. The Dodgers in blue over it right there. It doesn't look as white on your television screen as it is. Actually, it just seems like a big light if you're in the batter's box. But it affects the left-handed hitter more than it does the right-handed hitter. 0 oh, and 2 to Mike Marshall. It's interesting. Ripley way for him to turn it off is still on. Well, he hasn't made another motion. Well, you can see it there. That's why I'm thinking that maybe that wasn't it. I think that's what Eddie was upset about because he, it was a, you know we thought it was Bruce Froeming they wanted to move but I think it was the light on the scoreboard. Two balls and two strikes to the Dodger cleanup hitter. Giants trailing seven to nothing. It's an interesting pitcher there. And Marshall goes down swinging strikeout number two for Stu Tate. We're going to look and as I mentioned I think he's a power pitcher and I think you can see right there that he really is. I think his fastball is his best pitch and he had some giddy up even down low. I said it was a good pitcher before we showed Rick Dempsey sitting next to rookie John Wetland and talking to him in between innings trying to keep him relaxed and let him know exactly what he wants him to do when he goes back on the mound. A lot of times you do not see pitcher and catcher sit together on the bench. In the dirt to uh, Hamilton. One ball and no strike. Tate, 27 years old. 6 3, 205. He was the number eight selection in June of the 1984 draft. And there's the high fastball. And yes, sir, Terry Taylor said he went around. One ball and one strike. And this is his wedding anniversary, I see here. Hmm. Well, Boy, what a big day for this guy. Hmm. John, question here. Do you ever go to a game and sit out never, in the stands? Never. So you only get the game from the press box perspective, which is not really a no, you know a real good perspective in most cases. It's okay for what you do, writing a story, but about there you see the Astros have taken a seven to six lead in the 14th inning against the Braves. This is the Weaver in right field, and he will make the catch. Three up, three down here in the fourth after three and a half. Dodgers leading the Giants seven to nothing. Well, we
we have no more calls, please. We have a winner in our giant stumper contest this evening. Although things right now for Roger Craig may not be going as fast as he would like them to, trailing seven to nothing. Also realizing that the Padres have won in Cincinnati and the Astros have taken the lead in extra innings over Atlanta. There you see the update. Tony Gwynn went one for four in that Cincinnati San Diego ball game. So right now Gwynn still leading Clark by the slimmest of margins. Well, I think it'll be interesting because the last three games of the season these two will square off again in San Diego. Clark fouls it at home plate. Will Clark single in the first inning he is the only Giants base hit. You look at the line score it looks a little strange seven nine and oh for the Dodgers. Oh one and oh for the Giants for a team that has not hit well all season the Dodgers have come in here the last two days and put a lot of hits on the board. Here's the 0 one to Clark and he swings and misses 0 and 2. See Will losing his balance after he swung through the pitch and he went after the high heater. As I've said before if Will has a weakness it is the high fastball. But that's the weakness of a lot of hitters. And Clark fouls it out of play. The count stays the same at 0 2. But it has to be a good high fastball. You have to have good velocity on it in order to throw it up there. Kevin Mitchell on deck for the Giants, followed by Ernest Riles. Wetland to Clark, and he took a little off, and Clark out in front grounds it to Randolph. He'll go to Murray, one out. Play will go 4 3. And Wetland retires Clark. Clark now one for two. That'll bring up Mitchell. Mitchell walked in the first inning. Kevin last night, a hit and four at bats, his average at 292. You know, Joe, one of the things about guys that hit a lot of home runs. There are usually a few that will tack on a lot of home runs in games like this where it's seven to nothing and on a lopsided game whether you're winning or losing you really can't say that about Kevin Mitchell. No he, most of his have helped. His home runs have tied a lot of games and have given the Giants leads. There you see the RBI leaders in the National League. Guerrero now one over Clark in second place and Mitchell follows this one down the right field line and out of play. I think the most consistent season I've ever seen for a power here was the one George Foster had I think 1977 or 8 he had 52 home runs drove in 150 runs or whatever but he was very consistent I don't think he hit over had games where he hit two home runs or more in a game but maybe once or twice you know and he just hit one today one tomorrow he was just very consistent because he almost he had 198 hits also I believe so he was very consistent and looking at Kevin Mitchell he's done basically the same thing he has not like you say gotten well or added on to his statistics in games that were way out of reach two balls and two strikes to Mitchell and there's a base hit to left field hit hard Gonzalez tracks it down and Kevin Mitchell with a one out single. Joan, do you vote on any of the awards? You not you have to have what is it, ten years or something? I'm not sure how many, but I know I don't have it. <laughs> yeah. I think you have I've heard you have to have ten years. I don't know for sure either before you get a chance to vote on most viable player, rookie to your side, young or whatever. Do you look forward to doing that? No. Why no, not? I don't. Well, you know, I've told other people this too, you know, when they say, Well, who do you think should get an MVP? Who should win Cy Young? So, you know, yeah, I, got enough, you, I got enough decisions in my own life to start making decisions for somebody else. Yeah, but it's gonna be yours at that time. <laughs> That's true. Well, That'll be your that vote. Time, maybe by that time I'll want yeah. to. Yeah. I mean I being honest with you, I I would like to vote. I don't have obviously I'm not a sports writer or whatever. You got an opinion on everything, Joe. So right. I but I'd like to vote. To yeah, I'd like to vote. Here's Riles, 0 and 1 count, and that's off the plate. One ball and one strike. I think it's especially difficult this year for any of the writers or people in the media to have to make a decision between Clark and Mitchell. And to take a stand, you'd almost feel like you're going to offend the other player. 
Riles down the left field line and out of play. I think the one thing that has normally happened is that the slugger in the most viable player award voting usually gets the nod because a slugger is special I guess not that a batting champion or a guy that hits 340 is not but a slugger is more devastating you know he kind of all of a sudden you're down and all of a sudden now you're ahead and I think that carries a lot of weight normally but I'm not here again. Riles hits it well to right field but Marshall looks like he's got a beat on it he does and he makes the catch. Could you see them both getting it there's been precedent no. for that. No I don't see that. Um, well I think if it were a panel of judges you probably they probably work it out so that they both could win it but when you start going by a point system boy yeah. you're talking about things having to fall exactly in place for someone to come up with. I guess this only happened one time in the National League that was Keith Hernandez and Willie Stargell tied you know were co MVPs they like, when they were co Cy Young Awards in the American League I remember Mike Cuellar and Denny McLean. Uh, it's like Dwayne says using the point system is I, it's almost impossible to come up with the same point total I would think unless they do get off to the side and say all right we're going to work the points this way. Yeah but that does not happen does it John. No I don't, <laughs> right I don't think so. I, I, I don't know. Your vote has to be in actually I guess before the season is over the way I understand it. So the playoffs have no bearing on what right. happens. Uh, and I think that's fair because if a guy is in the playoff and the other guy is not in the playoffs it's not fair if this guy has a good playoff and the other one doesn't because it's not his fault so yep. to speak. So I, I agree with that. I think position. The I think the interesting thing is if if you ask Mitchell who he would vote for I guarantee he'd vote for Clark and if you ask Clark he'd tell you that he'd think that that Kevin Mitchell should win it. Well, I don't think there's any doubt that both of them have had MVP type seasons but unfortunately there is only one MVP in the league. And I think the thing that I look at is you look at Kurt Gibson's numbers last year and he was an MVP and you look at both of these guys it's kind of almost a joke. And of course the irony is that neither one of them would be having the season they're having without the other. True. Two balls and one strike to Matt Williams two down Mitchell the base runner at first. And Matt chops it foul. That evens the count. Two balls and two strikes. Tough loss for the Chicago Cubs today. Philadelphia beat them nine to eight. Von Hayes hit his 24th home run. Sutcliffe was the starter. He was not involved in the decision. Lancaster took the loss. Carmen the winner, five and 15. 21,000 at Wrigley Field. And with that. Cubs lost the Cardinals win they are now only three back. Here's the two two and that's down and away full count. Take a look at that line score in this game Joe. <laughs> dun, 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 no that's dun, unbelievable. Dun, dun, dun. That was only a nine inning game. There it is. 18 hits apiece. Wind must have been blowing out at Wrigley. Matt Williams goes down swinging. Second time that Williams has struck out the Giants strand one here in the fourth we've played through four and it's the Dodgers seven Giants nothing. Tate has come in. He came in with one out in the third inning struck out Alfredo Griffin. Willie Randolph flew out to retire the side in the third and then he retired the Dodger order in the fourth inning so he has faced five men and he's retired all of them. Here it will be John Shelby Rick Dempsey and Jose Gonzalez here to call the fifth is Joe Morgan. Thank you Dwayne. I'm Joe Morgan along with Dwayne Kuyper and our special guest Joan Ryan of the or should I say Joan Ryan Tompkins. No, it's just Joan Ryan. OK still. Joan Ryan of the San Francisco Examiner fly ball to center field Butler back on the warning track and he makes the catch. It didn't seem as though Shelby hit the ball that well but it kept carrying and it didn't look like Butler really was worried about it too much. He just drifted back turned around a couple of times. Check him out. There's one turn and now he's going to spin around the other way and he makes the catch a tough play but Butler made it look easy. Well the way he went after I think fooled me as well. One down Rick Dempsey is the hitter. 
Dempsey has walked twice. He takes low for a ball. The Dodgers have seven runs on nine base hits. No errors. The Giants have no runs on only two base hits. Single by Will Clark in the first and a single by Kevin Mitchell in the fourth. The only two hits off a of Dodger rookie John Wetland. Stu Tate has come on in relief and he has done a good job. Struck out his first major league hitter that he faced. Breaking ball grounded foul outside of third. And some fans are trying to get a souvenir of this ball game. There you see rookie John Wetland. He sits on the bench. Wetland's also pinch, pitched in with a two with a double that drove in three runs. There's a good fastball on the outside corner and Dempsey goes down on strikes. And that's the third strikeout for Stu Tate. Now Stu Tate right now just breezing along and making some good pitches. It's Dempsey looking and as Joe said strikeout number three and he has struck out he has retired seven straight hitters. And Jose Gonzalez will be the hitter. Gonzalez has a couple of base hits in the ball game. He scored a couple of runs. That was a good curveball for a strike and as I mentioned at the beginning he did not seem to be nervous. He seemed to be very relaxed on the mound and the way his pitch will would back that up. And the one thing you like to see Joe he's getting the ball back from Kennedy and he's stepping right back on the rubber. How do you figure Montreal they lost to Pittsburgh nine to one. It almost looked like Montreal Joe was a team that was going to do everything it could do this year to try to win the pennant and it hasn't happened that way. I, after just before the All Star break I felt like Montreal was going to win the National League East because they had everything going for them I thought at that time chopped foul by Gonzalez and of course they had I thought they had the best starting pitching in the National League at that time and I thought that would carry him through but maybe pitching is not 80 or 90 percent of the ball game of well, the game they mortgaged a lot of their young players to get Mark Langston also got John Candelaria Jim Dwyer high with a fastball and the count goes to two balls and two strikes certainly no guarantees in this game and it's evident more and more when you pick up the newspaper and and see how acquisitions like a Langston certainly is going to help you but it's not a cinch strike three is Gonzalez cannot hold up on the swing strikeout number four for Stu Tate and as we go to the bottom of the fifth inning it's the Dodgers seven and the Giants nothing. Here's part two of tonight's feature on Will Clark in this segment Will will talk about his role as a team leader. In his four years with the Giants Will Clark through his hard work and performance on the field has come to be known as a leader on the team. Will is the type of player that he's got a big mouth but he backs it up. And that's what type of player I like, you know. And I like a guy that can talk crazy and still back it up with his back, you know. And I like that's what I like about him. He got he's got a lot of confidence in himself. People talk about different people uh, uh, being catalysts on the ball club. Um, when things are struggling, when things are down, uh, the club I think looks to Will to pick us up. He's uh, the leader on the field uh, as well as off. Uh, he's definitely a franchise player, a, a player that you could uh, uh, start a a team by uh, you pick him and you go from there. I don't think that you can come out and sit there and say well you know I am the leader. You no know, um, what you do is you go out on the field and you execute and you perform and uh, you're looked up to by your peers and uh, so I don't necessarily think of myself a leader in the clubhouse because we have people like well Bob Brindley back now, Mike Kruko, uh, Chris Spire, people like that. But uh, you know, I think of my, myself as a leader on the field. Um, by the way you go about your job, by the actions that you do, and uh, by the way you play the game. Well, Will Clark also made another statement. I think is very indic is indicative of the way that he thinks. And he said, "You can't walk out and say I'm the leader. I think the players choose the leader who they follow." I think in the past a lot of I've seen a lot of times where management tried to designate a leader It doesn't work that way. The players are the ones that designate the leader and I think Will understands that and 
I think as he's listening to those two segments, he's got his head screwed on very tight. Yeah, I can't. I think I, it's going to be all right. I can't imagine Joe a guy calling a clubhouse meeting and then saying, "Listen, uh, I'm going to be your leader this year." Right. He's exactly. Say, hey, well, Daryl Strawberry did it. <laughs> well, it didn't work. You see how that worked. The Dodgers have a new third baseman. Lenny Harris is now at third base for the Dodgers. There you see Lenny. I assume he goes into the spot that was vacated by Hamilton, which is the fifth spot. As Terry Kennedy swings and fouls John Wetland's first pitch back here in the bottom of the fifth. There you see Jeff Hamilton leaving. We'll probably get a report later on on why he left the ball game. But there's Lenny Harris at third. Kennedy takes strike two. And as Dwayne mentioned, when the Giants fell behind by a score of four to nothing, Wetland was struggling at that time with his pitches and all of a sudden after he got the four run lead he has been more relaxed thrown all his pitches and been very comfortable out there on the mound. The Dodgers scored one in the first two in the sec three in the second and three in the third and they lead seven to nothing as we're in the bottom of the fifth inning. And Joan Ryan is getting her story tonight for about Stu Tate, watching him very closely. They bailed me out tonight. <laughs> didn't have anything to write about. In case you are not aware, Joan's column appears Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays in the San Francisco Co Examiner. I know you get a few days off anyway. <laughs> and I guess today is Joan's birthday. Uh, that's really sweet. Yeah. <laughs> Landmark one too. There's a pop up on the infield. Lenny Harris will get his first chance and he makes the catch. Well, landmark. I won't say how many. I mean, if you want to say it, that's up to you. I didn't tell him how many for me last right. night, but well, landmark you know. usually means that uh, it's one of those decades. Let's see, landmark. Well, the fans are booing because Nixon was going to pinch hit for Stu Tate. And the fans are booing because they wanted Stu Tate to remain in the ball game. It makes Nixon feel good. <laughs> and Joan Ryan booing as well because the yeah. <laughs> story is just been right. pinch hit for. Talk to Roger about that one. <laughs> and the fans start a chant, we want Stu. A little late now. And here's the picture of Stu. He's happy and that's a great way to break into the major leagues. I hope he remembers though if he goes out next time and gives up two or three runs <laughs> they won't let him forget it. Nice job of pitching by Stu Tate in his first major league ball game. <laughs> he retired two five he retired all the hitters he faced. There's a pop up on the infield by Tate. I mean I'm sorry Nixon. Alfredo Griffin makes the catch. Stu Tate faced eight hitters and he retired all eight. And there you see struck out three, no base on balls. Well, I'm sure he has earned his shot at pitching in a tight ball game. And hey. that's anything, everything that a pitcher would ask for. Well, you can see, looks like a very relaxed individual. You know, most guys at this stage, after doing a good job, would be a little excited. He just seems to be very relaxed there on the bench. Like he expected to do well, and that's the kind of confidence you want in your pitchers when you bring them up from the minor leagues. Weaver's the hitter. Jim is batting for the second time in the ball game. He had a line drive to first baseman Eddie Murray in the third inning. He came in when they had a double switch with for Tate to come in as a pitcher. He came in to hit in the ninth slot. Foul ball down the right field line. Eddie Murray is there, and he makes the catch. And that'll do it for the Giants here in the bottom of the fifth. And as Eddie Murray comes in, we'll say goodbye to our guest tonight, Joan Ryan. It's been a pleasure and happy birthday. Maybe Thanks next time we'll celebrate our birthday together. That's right. You come in to next time and we'll have some cake for you. All right. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Joan. Dodgers seven and the Giants nothing. And as we go to the sixth inning, Dwayne Kuyper will do the play-by-play. -play. There you see Camacho's record, 3-0. and 
And Denal Nixon goes into right field. There you see Donnell. And Dwayne Kuiper will do the play by play. Dwayne. Thanks, Joe. It'll be John Wetland and then the top of the order. Giants trailing seven to nothing. And Wetland, a big part of that seven run deficit as he came up with the bases loaded and one out in the third inning. And hit a ball right down the left field line past Ernest Riles. Drove home three runs. And that capped off an inning where the Dodgers scored three runs and took a seven to nothing lead. So Wetland trying to break a personal five game losing streak. He has lost his last five starts. He's lost two in a row in those starts as that's a call strike going two to Wetland for Camacho. Three and oh. With an even three earned run average. Ahead in the count to Wetland 0 and 2. And that's a call strike three. So Camacho blows away Wetland. And that's the first out here in the sixth inning. Take a look at some of the scores. We mentioned Pittsburgh 9, Montreal 1. Bobby Bonilla hit his 23rd home run. As Pittsburgh went on to pound Montreal. San Diego 3, Cincinnati 1. As the Padres scored two runs in the 10th inning to come up with that victory. Houston 7, Atlanta 6. Atlanta at one point led in that ball game 6 to 1. As that pitch misses to Alfredo Griffin. But thanks to a grand slam home run off the bat of Kevin Bass. Brought Houston back into the ball game and then they scored a run in the 14th. That home run, a solo shot by Alex Trevino. They go on to beat Atlanta 7 to 6. Also, Biggio with a home run. Four hours and six minutes, 2,700 at the ballpark <laughs> at Fulton County Stadium. One ball and a one strike to Alfredo Griffin. Willie Randolph is on deck, and Griffin down the left field line, but that ball will go foul and hits a fan in the hands. Mitchell will retrieve it, toss it to a fan. St. Louis beat New York 5 3. DePino the winner, David Cohn the loser, and Daly with his 12th save. One ball and two strikes. Camacho to Griffin, and he gets Griffin swinging. Well, we'll get another look at it. It looks like the split finger, as you can see, or the screwball. The ball really dives. You can see right there. The ball dives away from Alfredo Griffin, and he was fooled by the speed as well. Here's Willie Randolph. Randolph, two for three, a pair of singles and an RBI. First pitch, a call strike. The A's beat Cleveland eight to six. Ricky Henderson hit his 12th. Storm Davis, the winner, 18 and 7. Swindell, the loser, 13 and 6. And Dennis Eckersley with his 30th save. Breaking ball, strike two, 0 and 2 to Randolph. Now they had a doubleheader scheduled in New York. Brewers and Yankees, both games rained out. Boston pounded Toronto 10 3. Dewey Evans hit his 19th. And that just missed one and two. Winning pitcher Roger Clemens, 16 and 10. Jimmy Key took the loss. It's a high fastball. You can see Terry Kennedy tries to move it down a little bit into the strike zone. And Randolph rounds it to Matt Williams, and it goes under his glove. Randolph will be aboard on the air, and that comes with two outs here in the sixth inning. That was not an easy play, but it's one that you expect, you know, Major League shortstop to make. Jose Uribe would he makes that quite often, but it wasn't an easy play because he kind of got it in between hops. He had to charge the ball, and you'll see here right there in between hops. So it's a very difficult play. And I guess it scored as an error on shortstop Matt Williams. Here's Eddie Murray. Eddie Murray, one for two, 
Sacrifice fly in the first inning, a single in the second, and that pitch way off the plate. Well, with Boston beating Toronto, Baltimore whipping Detroit 9 to 2. The Orioles only a game back of the Toronto Blue Jays. And missing again is to Murray. Two balls and no strikes. Pendleton hit his 25th home run for Baltimore as Ballard was the winner and Frank Tanana the loser. Look out for those Orioles. They are regrouping. Well, they've got Tendleton back now, who was very hot at the first first half of the season. Eddie Murray skies went into center field. Butler backpedaling makes the catch. Side retired. Dodgers strand one after five and a half. They lead seven to nothing. Now back at Candleston, bottom of the sixth inning, and one of the youngsters out at the ballpark, bundled up, as well as I don't want to say oldsters, but as well as the <laughs> other mature. people here in the ballpark, mature individuals. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> as my brother in the truck says, the veteran, veteran fans, fans here yeah. at Candlestick. Well, the story has been John Wetland and the fact that. The Dodgers scored seven runs early. Butler will lead it off for the Giants. Brett Butler is 0 for 1. Popped out and he walked in the third inning. And takes the first pitch high. To round out the scoring in the American League, Texas beat Seattle 3 2. Chicago over Kansas City 7 2. Kansas City now falls four and a half behind the Oakland A's. And with California winning, they stay two and a half behind the team across the bay. Two balls and no strikes to Butler. And Butler taking all the way, takes a strike, two and one. Thompson on deck, followed by Clark and then Mitchell. Dodgers seven runs on nine hits, no errors. The Giants. No runs, two hits, and one error. You see, for the seventh straight year, Butler has topped 150 hit mark. Three and one now. There's the line score we're talking about a run in the first inning, three in the second, three in the third. And Butler draws a walk. Red hesitated, thought it may have been a strike, stuck around long enough to find out for sure that it was a ball. And he strolls down to first. Second walk for Butler. And here's Rowdy Thompson. Dwayne, we got a report on the reason Jeff Hamilton left the ball game. He had stiffness in his right shoulder. Robbie 0 for 2. Flew out to left field and then hit into a 6 4 3 double play. And that pitch misses 1 0. Oh. Well, the one thing, of course, Wetland does not want to do, and that's start walking people, start issuing free passes. And if the Giants can do some damage, one thing they'd like to do is cut into this lead so that when they work themselves around the batting order once again, they could have a shot out of at least tying the game. Well, I think that's what the Giants have to look at, trying to get one, a couple here, a couple there, and then, you know, take a shot at them in the eighth or ninth. Thompson taking 2 0. Now there's the leaders in triples in the National League Thompson with 11, Clark with 9, and then it's Coleman and Bonilla. So the Giants 1 2. Actually, three players tied for that second spot. 2 0 to Thompson. And Robbie taking all the way. It's 3 0. With that, there's action down in the Dodger bullpen. I recognize John Tudor on the right. Mike Hogan. Horton. No, that's Mickey Hort. Mike Horton. Well, he must be a rookie. Corgan. Now you see Dempsey's going to take as much time out there as he possibly can, and umpire Steve Ripley starts out to break up the conference, and Dempsey comes back behind the plate. So I think it's Mike Morgan. Thanks, Grady. <laughs> 
I make enough mistakes about you adding one to it. <laughs> Here's a 3 0 to Thompson, and that's a call strike. Yeah, Grady Lever, AD, and a good one. Yeah, he gave me Mike. First it was Horton, and then Horgan. I mean, this. His spelling tonight, you know, I don't know what he was looking at. Typically, we would mention him after he makes a mistake. Yeah. Call strike two to Robbie Thompson. I know Mike Morgan. There's Grady. That's, that's the guy that made the, the last mistake. <laughs> I know Mike Morgan. I don't know Mike Horgan. <laughs> I said it must be a rookie. Yeah, right. Full count to Robbie Thompson. Being an AD is like being an umpire. You don't notice him until <laughs> they blow one. Here's the 3 2, and it's ball four. Ball gets away from Dempsey. Butler will round second, and he will stay right there. So, Wetland now has walked two in a row, and here come Ron Paranowski. And this is the slow walk by yeah. the Dodger pitching coach. Yeah, I think they're giving whoever they want a little more time in the bullpen. There's Morgan on the left and John Tudor on the right. I don't think they would use Tudor. I think Morgan would be their choice unless unless he's going to come in maybe only pitch to one hitter. But they're going to leave Wetland in the ball game. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I wanted to see that Horgan guy. Yeah, <laughs> I want to check him out too. And Lasorda is probably thinking about putting him in as well. <laughs> yeah, there you see. Mike Morgan. Here's Will Clark facing the youngster, John Wetland. Clark one for two. A single and he grounded out to second and on the first pitch he fouls it back. Giants have won 13 of their last 19 ball games. They have had to play at that rate because of the great play by the San Diego Padres. Padres certainly not slowing down. All they have done is gone into Cincinnati and taken the first two of the, that three game series at Riverfront. Here's the 0 1 to Clark, and that's a call strike 0 and 2. So Wetland couldn't find the plate to Butler and Thompson quickly out in front of Clark. This is a good pitch right on the outside corner. You see a tail away from Will. Not a pitch that Will could jerk out of the ballpark. Here's the 0 2, and Clark loops it to left field. But Gonzalez in his tracks makes the catch. One out. That'll bring up Kevin Mitchell. When I get a look at Will here, I think he gets fooled a little bit by the speed of this breaking ball. It was up in the strike zone. Yeah, you can see he starts to go forward a little before he normally does. And he tries to take it the other way. But I think the bat speed slowed down and the curveball got on his hands a little bit. Mitchell swings and misses 0 and 1. Kevin 1 for 1, walked in the first inning, singled in the fourth. Mitchell league leader in home runs and RBIs. Batting average at 293. And that's in the dirt. Both runners will advance. So the Giants now an opportunity to get on the board with a sacrifice fly. Ball just got away from him, Joe. It's another curveball, and you can see it bounce off to the right side of Rick Dempsey, and by the time he gets his glove out there, it bounces away. So just as they say, you're a major league wild pitch. One thing he has done is they've been bouncing and they're the breaking ball. That's the only pitches that have really gotten away from him tonight. One ball, one strike, one out. Thompson at second, Butler at third. Giants trailing seven to nothing. Ernest Riles on deck for the Giants. And Mitchell takes his pitch down and away two and one. Mitchell this year against the Dodgers three home runs 14 RBIs. 
See Kevin needs two home runs for an even 100 in his career. And Mitchell taking again and it is three and one. That was an unusual pitch there. And that the count was already two and one. He has not been able to get the breaking ball over and he goes with it again. And it's three and one. So I think you a lot of times pitchers will tell you you'd rather throw the fastball two and one rather than throw it three and one to a slugger. Here is the three one and Mitchell hits it off his fist. Honey Harris will let the run score. The play will be at first. Thompson moves to third and the Giants on the board. Now seven to one Dodger lead. Mitchell with RBI number 121. So the wild pitch not only keeps the Giants out of a double play situation, but also gives the Giants a chance to get on the scoreboard. Here's Riles. Riles 0 for 2. And he takes the first pitch, 1 and 0. Matt Williams on deck. Matt having struck out twice and two at bats. And Riles hits one deep to right, and this baby is gone. Home run. 7 3. Number seven for Ernest Riles. And for that home run, Budweiser will donate $100 to SAD, Students Against Drunk Driving, in the name of Ernest Riles. Riles is a good fastball hitter, and I think what has happened is Wetland's fastball has lost a little bit of its pop. And he gets a fastball here about bell tie inside part of the plate and he really drives it up out of here balls a home run from the time it leaves the bat. And the Giants pick up two more so now they trail by a score seven to three and that's exactly the way you want to do this get a couple here a couple there and they still have at least they have ten outs left which which is score four runs They have three more innings plus the remaining out in this inning. Well, as I men mentioned, Joe, the more you hit, the better opportunity you have of getting back to the top of the order for the Giants, and certainly they would like to do that more than just one more time. Right. Now, Wetland taken out of the ball game. Riles with the smile in the Giants' dugout, and the new pitcher. Is Mike Morgan. Well, we'll get another look at it. He picks his leg up pretty high. That's pretty high leg kick, but he opens his hips very well, gets the bat through the hitting zone with a lot of bat speed. And he hits it into the football bleachers. You know, I've seen a lot of guys raise their legs higher now than before. I don't know. And usually you see that in the American League because of the off speed pitches and the breaking balls. I remember, you know, guys like, I guess, Cecil Cooper and some of those guys used to do that. They'd lean back on their back foot, back leg, and then raise their front foot as they went in. And we're going to get a look at Mike Morgan. Well, how about this Sadahara old guy? Yeah, that guy used to do pretty well with it. I mean, he used to just balance himself basically on his back foot, which would have been his his left, left foot. foot. And they threw a lot of all speed pitches in Japan, I'm told. Mel Ott, of course, is probably the most famous American hitter that used the leg lift. But I suppose it goes back to Joe and Will Clark said. You can do a lot of things, but when you get through that hitting area, basically everybody should do the same thing. Well, there are things that have been known to be successful when you get to that point, and other things that are hit and miss, so to speak. I don't think there's any one way that you have to hit a baseball, but like he says, you have to try to get yourself in a certain position to get the bat through the hitting zone. 
Call strike to Matt Williams 0 and 2. Matt Williams, it appears, has been looking at 0 and 2 all night. Two down. Giants have scored three times here in the sixth inning. And that ball is down in the dirt. One ball and two strikes. And I tell you what, Rick Dempsey saying, why can't these guys throw a 60 foot six inch curveball? <laughs> All these 58 footers are going to kill me back here. He's taking a lot of balls off the mask, off the chest, and he's chased a few back to the screen. All off the breaking ball. One and two to Matt Williams. And Matt goes down swinging for the third time. The Giants, three runs here in the sixth inning. After six complete, it's the Dodgers seven and the Giants three. Well, it's time for the answer to tonight's Azuzu Stumper. The question, who is the last major leaguer to win a batting title and lead his league in RBIs in the same season? Well, the answer, Al Oliver in 1982. Congratulations to Elisa Phillipscheck of Woodacre, California. Elisa wins two tickets to a Giants home game in the 1990 season. We'll be right back after these messages. Now well, we've reached the seventh inning and the Dodgers leading the Giants seven to three Giants three runs on three hits and an error Dodgers seven runs on nine hits and no errors Ernest Riles inching the Giants back into this ball game with a two run home run in the sixth inning. Well it's a fastball about Bell tie and actually looks like it's almost in the middle of the plate. And when you get a lot of pitches in that zone, a lot of major leaguers can hit at the ball very hard. And Riles hit that one very hard into the first deck in right field and draws the Giants two runs closer. Now Camacho will be facing Marshall Harris and Shelby. And Marshall grounds the first one to Matt Williams into Clark. And Marshall retired one out. One pitch, one out here in the seventh. That'll bring up Lenny Harris who replaced Jeff Hamilton. For Harris this will be his first at bat. Harris played last night. He played left field and he went one for four with an RBI. You see Camacho pitching from a stretch even though. There are no base runners on base. A lot of times pitchers will get into the habit of doing exactly that and just would prefer to pitch that way to an O to Harris. John Shelby on deck for the Dodgers. And Harris pops it up. See if Riles will have a play on it. And he does and he makes the catch two down. Dwayne, you were talking about, you know, the postseason award, Cy Young, most valuable player, rookie of the year. Do you have picks in all those categories, or, or what? Or should we just discuss the American League tonight? Well, I think that, you know, school's out on a lot of those picks yet. I think the last week of the season. May determine, and a lot of times it has a lot to, to do, Joe, with who wins as far as the teams. As here's Shelby, and that's a breaking ball for a call strike, 0 1. I think the only thing that I'm not completely sold on in my own mind in, in, is the National League Cy Young Award. I think obviously you, you, know, you have to look at Mark Davis, you have to look at Mike Scott. As the front runners, I guess, but I'm not sure. One and one to Shelby. Now it's one and two. Well, Saberhagen. Right. Well, he's pitched well the second half. He didn't pitch as well the first half. And I wonder, you know, how do you how do you rate that? And Shelby goes down swinging. So Camacho. Retires the side in order here in the seventh after six and a half. Dodgers seven, Giants three. Uh, here the Giants trail the Dodgers by four. 
Dodgers seven Giants three bottom of the seventh inning Morgan facing the bottom of the Giants batting order Kennedy will be the leadoff hitter and Kennedy takes the first pitch down one and oh. There you see Trevor Wilson warming up for the Giants. And Kennedy hits it hard and right at Trevor Wilson. Makes the catch, hands it to a fan. And continues his warm up. One ball and one strike. Now, now they wish Joan Ryan a happy birthday on the big board here at Candlestick. And Kennedy fouling it down the left field line. At least stayed fair. When do it back? So Kennedy hitting a pop fly down the left field line in fair territory to Jose Gonzalez. There's the board. And if Joan thought for one second that she was going to get out of here with nobody knowing it was her birthday, pretty good joke on her. I thought I could sneak by yesterday. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, I didn't think we were people were around looking through the books, <laughs> looking for dates. Here's Nixon. Nixon popped out to Alfredo Griffin, and he lays one down, and this ball is going to be foul. Harris was in tight at third, but Nixon made a good enough bunt that if it would have been fair, I think he could have been able to beat it out. You can see he tries to drop it down. And he gets a big bounce that gives him time to run before it comes down. But you can see the ball is foul after two bounces. You know, talking about Saberhagen, he leads the American League in earned run average, and he leads and wins with 20. Now the other side of the coin would be Dave Stewart has lost two wins his last two outings. Yeah. Because of a couple of home runs hit off of Dennis Eckersley in the ninth inning. But Saberhagen hasn't been needing any help. He's been going nine. I, I really think that wins and losses are what counts, and I've said that all along. Because I mean, for that matter, Paul Hershiser has one of the lowest earned run averages in the National League. You're not going to say he's a Cy Young Award favorite. Here's the 0-2 to Nixon, and it's in the dirt. And another bouncer off the leg of Rick Dempsey. So you can Oberfeld on deck. Well, the only reason I mentioned the earned run average. Well, I think it's good if, they're, if, if they're tied. If right. there are, you know, the intangibles, you've got Saberhagen, Stewart, Moore, if they're all close. Right. You know, and then maybe the people that are voting look for something else to determine one out of those three that they would vote for. And if they do indeed look at earned run averages, well, Saberhagen is leading the lead. And they're going to call him out, and Dempsey tags Nixon out. Well, I think the umpires did all they could do. They called the play right away, and which would have allowed Nixon to run, but Nixon was kind of looking down at the ground because he didn't think he swung. But all you can do is have the umpire call it right away, which they did. Terry Tater will get a look at it. See, he goes, he checks his swing. Nixon thinks it's a ball. See, he's looking down at the ground. He's not looking. And they... And there you see Terry Tater is calling the swing, but Nixon didn't see it. And now he's out. And here's Oberfeld. Oberfeld last night came up with a big pinch hit. To lead off that fifth inning where the Giants scored those three runs, Oberfeld single. Ended up was forced at second base. But he got the inning started and the Giants ended up beating the Dodgers three to two. Off the plate to Oberfeld, two balls and one strike. Obi with that single. Last night, 13 pinch hits on the year. And now it's three and one. You know, rare in the American League, most of the time it's a starting pitcher that wins the Cy Young Award. And I believe the reason for that is because the starting pitcher can stay in the game longer. You know, they don't, they're not pinch hit for if the score is one to nothing. Like in the National League, you lose a lot of wins or chances to win a ball game. If you're trailing one to nothing in the seventh or eighth, they're going to take you out for a pinch hitter. In the American League, 
if you're one to nothing because of the designated hitter, you get to stay in longer. And therefore, I think it's easier to accumulate 20 wins in the American League than it is in the National League. But your earned run average will usually be higher in the American League simply because you're facing one more hitter every day in the lineup. Overfell grounds it to Randolph. He throws to Murray, and the Giants go one, two, three. Here in the seventh inning, after seven complete, it's the Dodgers seven, Giants three. Well, I think you see Roger Craig arguing with Terry Tater at first, I think, because Donnell Nixon argued with him when he was going out to his position, and I think Donnell Nixon has been ejected from the ball game. At least he's going to the Giants dugout, and Roger Craig continues the argument. First, Will Clark went over to help defend, you know, Donnell Nixon, but then Roger Craig had to go out. And there you see Nixon pointing out, he says, I didn't do anything, but Terry Tater probably thinks differently about it. Well, call it a night for Nixon. Roger heads back to the dugout. Well, in defense of Terry Tater, right here, Nixon tries to check his swing. Okay, now Nixon, watch him. He looks down at the ground. He is not looking up. Now they're asking for the appeal at first base. Now, all Terry Tater can do is call him out right away. That gives Nixon time to run, and he did that. You can see. So, you know, in defense of Terry Tater, I think he did all he could do. I think the problem was that Nixon was actually looking down at the ground and did not see Terry Tater calling him out. Now, whether he swung or not is a different story. Trevor Wilson, new pitcher for the Giants. He is one and three with a 471 earned run average. Wilson will come in to face Dempsey. Jose Gonzalez and Dave Anderson is getting loose, so Anderson may be the third hitter here this inning. And Candy Maldonado goes in to replace Danelle Nixon. Wilson first pitch to Dempsey, a call strike, 0 and 1. There's Maldonado. <laughs> 0 and 1 to Rick Dempsey. One ball and one strike. Joe and I talking between innings. Difficult choice when you look at the MVP for the American League as this ball is popped on the infield. Ernest Riles taking charge makes the catch. MC retired, and that'll bring up Jose Gonzalez. You look at offensive players, and obviously a lot of guys having good years, Joe. Just having, you know, you look for the player that has the, the good batting average, you know, a lot of home runs and RBIs, and you're looking for one guy that is sharing. A lead in, in all three of those departments. And you really don't see it. And it, then you start looking for players that are playing on winning teams, and that eliminates a lot of players as well. So, you know, it may come down to one of the pitchers winning the MVP. That's a good point. I I think that the MVP should be for a player, but I'm prejudiced in that case because I think the Cy Young is for a guy to, you know, for a pitcher to win. Gonzalez pops out to Butler, two down. All right, I think you've done enough of my inning now. I just wanted to let you get even with me since I've taken most of yours throughout the year. I'll let you. You did the first two hitters. Now that'll probably make us even for the year. I'll I'll finish it up. All right. Well, I got the first two outs. So okay. No, but I, I I look at a guy like Robin Yant who has done well in just about all the categories that you're talking about. He's in the lead, in the top ten in batting average, um, RBIs. And et cetera, et cetera. And he's a pretty good defensive center fielder. So he may be one of the guys that they'll have to look at because you look at McGriff on a winning team, he's got home runs, but he doesn't have the RBIs. That was a swing and a miss by Anderson, and it counts no balls and two strikes. Anderson is batting here for Morgan, and we'll see Jay Howell, I'm sure, in the eighth and ninth for the Dodgers. Low with a breaking ball, and Trevor kind of bounces off the mound. He looked like he got his spike caught as he released the ball. There, you see him limping a little bit. And Will Clark and Terry Kennedy go out to check on him. Says he's okay. He just caught his spike in the dirt. 
Now watch Wilson. Yeah, he slipped a little bit and then goes down to one knee. Now in the National League, Joe, I think it'll be Mark Davis that'll win the Cy Young. Right, I agree. There's a ground ball to shortstop. Matt Williams charges. And the Dodgers go one, two, three here in the eighth inning. And after seven and a half, it's the Dodgers seven and the Giants three. There you see Jay Howell. He's a new Dodger pitcher as we go to the bottom of the eighth inning and the Giants trail seven to three. Jay Howell, there you see, leads the Dodgers with 26 saves and a fantastic earned run average, 1.18. And he's got a five and three one loss record. Now the last time we saw Jay Howell basically threw nothing but breaking balls. Wayne is kind of interesting or maybe Bob Leary wouldn't think so but there's only twenty three thousand five hundred and seven here for a Dodger game which is unusual because the Dodgers usually draw no matter what the situation is but with the Giants battling for a pennant you would think that maybe the combination of the two would draw more than twenty three thousand fans. Well I think some of the fans in the Bay Area think that it's over. Well there are a lot of people in the area that think that it's over and I guess since we're players and we've seen teams lose leads you can't say it's over like Yogi says it's never over till it's over. And so I think maybe we should wait a little bit before we say the A's are going to be in the playoffs and the Giants as well. I mean there's no doubt that if you're going to put any odds on it you'd have to you know say the Giants and the A's are favored but. Anything can happen in the next couple of weeks. Brett Butler will lead it off as the Giants are trying to make up a four run deficit here in the bottom of the eighth inning. Butler is 0 for 1, but he does have two bases on balls, and he did score a run for the Giants in the sixth inning, and he takes a strike from Howell. There you see Butler's nickname, Bugsy. Fastball hit hard but foul outside of first base. And the count's no balls and two strikes to Butler. Well, Giants tag Butler with that because of the wide brim hats that Butler would wear in the road trips. And they came up with Bugsy and as usual it stuck. And I'm sure that Mike Kruko had a lot to do with it. 0 2 pitch fastball hit eye in the air in the right center field. Shelby is calling. And he makes the catch. So Butler is retired. And it'll be Robbie Thompson. He'll be followed by Will Clark. Thompson's 0 for, 0 for 2 in the ball game. He did have a base on balls, and he also scored a run in the sixth inning. He scored ahead of Ernest Riles two run homer. Strike by Jay Howell. Kind of interesting when you see a guy like Howell, he comes in and he tries to make sure he gets out in front. First pitch, fastball, first pitch, strike. And the counts, no balls and two strikes to Robbie Thompson. Well, I think the guy that's the best at that that I have seen in the last couple of years is Dennis Eckersley. Right. He will get ahead of you. And then he'll bury you. There's a fastball over the outside corner. Call strike three. You can see the target given by Dempsey was to, for a high fastball, maybe an 0-2 waist pitch. There you see the high target. Well, Al chose to throw it about six inches to a foot below the target, and he got Thompson looking. That may have been a case where he was trying to hit the glove and missed. Will Clark. Has one base hit in three attempts. Fastball. Foul down the left field line and out of play. Will came in trailing Tony Gwynn by a point. Gwynn went one for four in Cincinnati. And Will is one for three here. And if you're wondering, is there anyone that could sneak up on Clark and Gwynn? No. 
Yeah. Lonnie Smith is hitting 315. He's third. There's a high fastball popped up on the infield. Lenny Harris is calling and he makes the catch. And so the Giants go quietly again here in the eighth inning. And we've completed eight full. It's the Dodgers seven and the Giants three. And we'll be right back after these messages. And the Giants, as you can see, only have three base hits. A home run by Riles, a single by Will Clark, and also a single by Kevin Mitchell. And the Dodgers continue to have action in their bullpen as Alfredo Griffin will lead it off for the Dodgers in the ninth. Griffin is one for three in the ball game with an RBI and a run score. He swings and misses at a fastball down and in. Griffin has struck out his last two times to the plate. For the Giants in the ninth, it'll be Mitchell, Riles, and Williams. Here's a pitch outside, and it's one and one. Trevor Wilson pitched well in his last outing, is also. There's a check swing on a high fastball. Well, if you're looking forward to the rest of the weekend or tomorrow night and then the rest of the weekend, Ramon Martinez will pitch for the Dodgers tomorrow. His record is five and three. There's a liner to shortstop. Matt Williams makes the catch. And there's one down for the Dodgers here in the ninth. Ramon Martinez will go for the Dodgers tomorrow evening, and he'll be opposed by Kelly Downs. Martinez is five and three and Downs is three and six. On Friday, the Houston series will have Mark Portugal going against Scotty Gareltz. Portugal is six and one, and Scotty Gareltz is 14 and three. And there you see the stat that the Dodgers have not scored since the third inning. In fact, they haven't had a hit since the third inning. But they did enough damage in the first three innings to build up the seven to nothing lead and the Giants have come back with three. On Saturday afternoon it'll be Mike Scott 20 game winner against Rick Russell. That's at 105 and on Sunday it'll be Rick Roden. Going against Don Robinson Roden is two and six. Don Robinson is 12 and 10 and I believe Sunday's game will be telecast by Dwayne and Hank and Ron on KTVU. Well, still school out to find out if Don Robinson is going to be healthy enough to pitch that game. Ground ball to the right side. Robbie backs up on the edge of the grass and he throws Randolph out. And there are two down for the Dodgers in in the ninth. And the one thing you do not want to see is one of your top starters like Don Robinson have to miss more than one start, especially down the stretch. Don Robinson has won a lot of big ball games for the Giants. And any game from here on out would be considered big. Eddie Murray will be the hitter. Murray has one base hit and he's driven in a run. And he grounds it to third base. Riles backs up, throws him out. And that'll do it for the Dodgers in the ninth. We go to the bottom of the ninth inning. And the Giants have their last chance and they trail by four. Well, you see the Giants have only been able to muster three base hits in tonight's ball game. So they trail by a score of seven to three. Jay Howell will be trying to finish it up. I don't think he gets a save for this because the Dodgers were four runs ahead when he came in. There you see Don Robinson. Dwayne was talking about the fact that he is a probable starter for Sunday afternoon's contest. But he left the last ball game with a knee injury, and we don't know how that is responding. But we may not know right up until game time. <laughs> There's Donnie. Well, Robbie has a way of bouncing back. All you have to do is take a look at all the scars on his body. Very close personal friends with the orthopedic surgeons around the country. And he has a way of, like I said, pitching in the big games and doing very well. Well, the throw goes down to second base, and Kevin Mitchell will lead it off for the Giants. Kevin has one of the three base hits. He also has driven in a run with a sacrifice fly, which was his 121st run batted in. 
Will Clark led the National League with 109 last year. Kevin Mitchell has hit 45 home runs, which is the most since Willie McCovey hit 45 in 1969 for a Giants player. Jay Howell trying to finish it up for the Dodgers. Fastball swung on and foul straight back by Kevin. Howell gave him a fastball on the inside part of the plate, and Kevin had a very good rip at it. Well, Howell throwing more fastballs than the last time we've seen him. Of course, that was a ball game where he pitched about four innings in extra innings in a tight game. He went to his breaking ball. Fastball up and in. They check with Terry Tater at first base. He says no swing. And it's two and one. Ernest Riles is on deck. He'll be followed by Matt Williams. Here's a 2 1 pitch fastball hit high and deep to center field going back looking up it's gone. For Kevin Mitchell that's number 46 an RBI 121 22 I'm sorry it's the second RBI of the ball game. So he surpasses Willie McCovey's. 45 in 1969. And that 46 home run for Kevin Mitchell. Budweiser will donate $100 to SAD Students Against Drunk Driving in the name of Kevin Mitchell. And Ernest Riles is a hitter. He takes a strike on the outside corner. And the Giants have narrowed their margin to 7 to 4 on Kevin Mitchell's 46th home run. Breaking ball and it's high for a count of one ball and one strike. Mitchell's home run was measured at 417 feet. So that means it went 17 feet beyond the 400 foot barrier in center field. And the fans get back into the ball game. Strike two call as Jay Howell throws another fastball. There you get a look at Kevin. Now it's a pitch down and just. A bit on the inside part of the plate Shelby goes back and this ball lands one bounce and up into the grass behind center field breaking ball hitting the hole base hit the right field. So the Giants start a rally here in the bottom of the ninth inning. They trail by three so the tying run is in the on deck circle. Well, Riles just hits it between Eddie Murray and Randolph, just beyond the outstretched glove of Willie Randolph. Giants need to get one more guy on, and then they've got the tying run at the plate. Right now, the tying run is in the on deck circle. Jay Howell is on facing Matt Williams. Matt has struck out three straight times in the ball game. Fastball hit high and deep to right center field. And it's off the fence, the bottom of the fence. Coming around the score is Riles. He better hurry. The throw is over Dempsey's head. And Riles comes in to score. And Matt Williams ends up at second with a double. And it's a 7 to 5 ball game. Well, Joe, the Di Giants put a little dent into the ERA of, of Jay Howell. And Matt Williams goes the other way. Thought for a minute this ball was going to get out of here. Marshall over his head. Shelby with a good play off the fence. And then Willie Randolph's throw over the head of Rick Dempsey. Otherwise, they may have had a shot at Ernest Riles. There you see Matt Williams going the other way on the fastball. I think Matt thinks it's out of here too. But it's a double and it does bring the tying run to the plate in the person of Terry Kennedy. Everybody thought it was out of here actually. And it goes as a double and an RBI. And the Giants are rallying with no one down here. They only trail by two now and Terry Kennedy's in the batter's box. 
And Jay Howell throws ball one. So we've had a home run by Kevin Mitchell leading off the ninth. We had a single by Ernest Riles and a double by Matt Williams. Here's the pitch by Howell. Fastball, base hit the right field. They're going to wave Mitch, Matt Williams around, and it's a seven to six ball game. And Terry Kennedy is on it first. Well, the Giants made believers out of a lot of people with that game in Cincinnati where they came back to win nine to eight. Here you see Kennedy driving home Matt Williams. Now the Giants trail by one. Nobody out. Tying run at first. And Kennedy once again ripping it in the hole. Be a pinch runner. Mike Benjamin goes in to run for Terry Kennedy at first. There you see Kennedy getting congratulations from his teammates. And Jay Howell is going to depart. And it looks like Mike Hartley is coming in. John Tudor continues to throw in the bullpen. That's Mike Hartley coming in from the Dodger bullpen. And as Dwayne said, they're putting a little dent in Jay Howell's 1.18 earned run average. That'll put a real big dent, giving up three runs in, in one inning. Basically, he pitched the eighth inning and he got out of it, but the ninth inning he hasn't retired anyone. And he's given up three runs. All earned. There you see Chris Fire. He comes out to pinch hit for Candy Maldonado, which says that they're going to bunt sacrifice. As you see, Candy goes back. Well, what do we know about Hartley? He has pitched in four innings this year. He has struck out two. He has not allowed a run. He hasn't even allowed a base hit. Hartley. His first year in the big leagues. Actually is probably his first month. He is 6'1", 185. Trying to look at his stats, it appears that Hartley looking at his minor league numbers that he would be considered a strikeout pitcher. Now, now, now Mike Log is going to come out and bat in place of the pitcher, Trevor Wilson. And I guess that's going to be in case. Well, that's in case Chris Byer bunts the tying run to second base or gets in there any other way. I think just because of the situation on the that Chris Byer will be sent up there to try to sacrifice. Spire, of course, is a good bunner. And he also is a good hit and run man, so gives Roger Craig a couple of options. I mean, Joe, you talk about tough jobs that you have to do in the big leagues going in for defense. Coming in trying to earn a save, you only get one opportunity to do it. How about laying down a sacrifice bunt when you when everybody knows that's what you're gonna do? That's true. That's a lot of pressure on Chris to do his job. But he's been in this position before. He only has two sacrifice bunts, but that's because he's been on the disabled list quite a bit this year. He's missed a lot of ball games. Well, the Giants have come back for three here in the bottom of the ninth, but they need one more. And Mike Benjamin leads the way at first base. He's pinch running for Terry Kennedy, and Chris Fire squares around, and he's almost hit with the pitch as Hartley fires a fastball up and in. Well, it looks like Roger Craig is back to having fun for a long time. Sat in the dugout. Really not a whole lot he could do. There you see Roger. 
fire around the butt and he takes a strike and it's one and one. The Giants came into the bottom of the ninth trailing seven to three. Kevin Mitchell led off with his 46th home run of the season. Ernest Riles single. Matt Williams with a double to drive him in. And Terry Kennedy single to drive in Matt Williams. And we're at seven to six right now. And Mike Benjamin is pinch running for Terry Kennedy at first base. Ball two outside, and it's two and one. And Joe, it looks like young right hander throws hard. Mike Hartley looking at those minor league numbers. Last year in San Antonio, 45 innings pitch, he struck out 57. That sounds like he's a power pitcher. Two and one to Chris. There goes the runner. There's a line of the right field, but it might be caught. No, Mike Marshall misses it. The ball gets away, going to second. They're holding him up at third, but he almost ran through the side, Mike Benjamin. And Chris Byer goes into second. If Marshall would have made the catch, they had a cinch double play at first base because Benjamin was going on the hit and run. But he was not able to come up with the catch, and the Giants have runners at second and third. Well, Marshall makes a great effort. He comes in, he dives for it, and the ball kicks off his leg and then rolls a long way away from him. And because of that, there was some thought about sending Benjamin. And you can see right there, here he comes, and Fahey holds him up at the last minute. Now they have first base open, so Roger Craig calls Mike Laga back because they think if they send him up to hit, they may walk him intentionally. So now we're going to have a pinch hitter for Trevor Wilson. Greg Litton is going to come up to pinch hit. The Dodgers have John Tudor warmed up in their bullpen. Now they get Tim Cruz is the only one throwing down there, number 52. Well, Tudor is still there. And I guess Tudor would come in to pitch, pitch to a left-hander if the situation dictated it. And out comes Ron Paranowski again. They've got to decide here whether to walk Litton to put a force out at any base or to go ahead and pitch to him. Gutsy, try to get him out. Gutsy play, Joe. Take off the bunt, put on the hit and run. Well, I think, as we mentioned, Chris Byer is the guy you can do that with because he's a veteran and he's been in this situation before. And he knows what he's supposed to do, and he does it again as he hits a double off of... Well, I guess they're scoring it as a single and an error. I'm not sure. I see an error on the board now. I don't understand how it can be a single and an error when the guy made a diving attempt, but... Nevertheless, Chris Byers at second base. If you die for the ball, if you don't catch it, it's got to be an error all the way or it's got to be a base hit all the way. And he did not kick it after the single, after the ball hit the ground. Well, the, the Dodgers are playing the infield in on the right, and I guess they're going to go a pitch to Greg Litton. He swings and fouls it at home plate. It's kind of a dangerous play as far as the Dodgers are concerned if you play the infield in because it cuts down the range of your infielders and if the ball goes through the infield the winning run could score but that's the way they're playing it halfway on the right and I guess a little less than halfway on the left there you see Chris Byer he would be the winning run at second base Mike Benjamin is over at third Breaking ball in the dirt, and I guess I was wrong. They did not give Chris Byer a single. It was an error all the way, Dwayne. A diving attempt in right field by Mike Marshall has scored an error all the way, and I... That's unfair, first of all, to Chris Byer, I think, because he did the job. And I thought, reading the rule book, it said any ball that cannot be handled with routine effort should be scored as a base hit and that was definitely not a routine play for Mike Marshall in right field when you have to die for a ball that'll be changed 
Well, it should have never gone up that way. One ball, one strike to Greg Litton. Inside. They check with Terry Tater down at first base. He says no swing. And the counts two balls and one strike. Here's the play. Mike Marshall is diving for it. And they score that as an error. I, I don't quite understand that. That is a very tough play to make. And in fairness to Mike Marshall, he came in to try to make the play and, and smother it. And smothered the ball. That was, that was a good play. It's just it's a base hit all the way, in my opinion. Two and one. Base hit to left field. The tying run will come in to score, but because it was hit to the left side, Chris Fire had to hold up. Make sure it went through. And the Giants have tied it with four runs here in the bottom of the ninth inning, and they have the winning run at third with no one out. Well, for the folks that stuck around, they are really enjoying this ninth inning. Giants have tied it up. What do you think the San Diego Padres are saying about now? Well, the Padres, I'm sure, watching the scoreboard, obviously their game finished a long time ago. But I'm sure a few of them still trying to find out what is happening in this game. And you take a, a four-run lead into the ninth inning, you got to figure things are going to work pretty good, especially with Jay Howell on the mound. And a 1.18 earned run average. Well, Joe, no sooner had you said you play the infield in and you start taking some risk. And in this case, that ball may have been cut down if the infield were playing back. Well, the, the ball would not have gone through the infield. There you see Spire backing up. He had to make sure the ball went through because if Griffin would have been able to catch it, he would have had a play on him at third. But if the infield was back, I guarantee you this ball does not get through the infield because it was hit off the fist. It was a broken bat, and Griffin would have been able to make the stop. He may not have been able to throw anyone out at first base, but it would have kept Spire from going to third. And there you see Tommy Lasorda behind Bill Russell, the coach, and he is very upset because the Dodgers have blown a four-run lead in the bottom of the ninth inning. John Tudor comes on to pitch for the Dodgers, and the situation here, the choices that they have, Brett Butler will be the hitter. One of the choices is to go ahead and walk Brett and load the bases. But then you have a right hander in the person of Robbie Thompson coming up. But I think personally you have to walk him because you have a force out at any base if you do that. But with John Tudor on the mound they may feel like he can get Butler out. So it'll be just up to what, what the manager feels in this situation. John Tudor no wins no losses 3.14 earned run average. He's only pitched. 14 innings, 14 and a third. Well, the Dodgers look like they're going to go ahead and pitch to Brett Butler. They're playing the infield all the way in. And the outfield has come in very shallow as well. There's the first pitch to Butler, breaking ball, call strike one. Sidearm curveball, slow curve from John Tudor to Brett. Brett does not have a base hit in tonight's ball game. He has two bases on balls and he scored a run. We're all tied at seven in the bottom of the ninth. The Giants have the winning run at third base with no one down. The runner at first doesn't matter in this situation. Breaking ball and the ball game is over. Brett Butler hits one down the right field line and the Giants come back to win it in the bottom of the ninth by scoring five. Joe you really can't give up and the Giants proved once again that if you can stick it out put a bunch of hits together you got a chance to come with to come back and win the ball game and I can't believe the way this team has done that as many times as they have in 1989. Now you see Rick Dempsey he was behind the plate when all this happened but there are a lot of heroes in the Giants dugout tonight. None more important than Brett Butler as for the second time in this last week he's driven in the winning run with a base hit. 
in the bottom of the ninth. Giants win it eight to seven, and we'll be right back after these messages.